What a place to be on a Friday night in May. It's Paris in the spring as the Bellator cage has made its way to France, to the city of light, home of so many iconic sights, so many perfect memories. And amidst all of the beauty and wonder of this staggering setting, we've got our own theater of beauty and wonder as we head to the Accor Arena in the east of Paris, a croissant's throw from the banks of the River Seine. They love their MMA here. The arena sold out in the blink of an eye, and we're going to watch Gegard Mousasi and Fabian Edwards go for it at middleweight. It is a legend against a fighter who believes that he can beat him. And then we have the fan favorite, the local fighter, Mansour Barnawi, who takes on Brent Primus as the story of the Bellator lightweight World Grand Prix continues to unfold. The rest of that main card is simply riveting to a true pick and fight between Kane Moussa of Manchester and the Frenchman Thibaut Guti, both teak tough and seemingly impossible to separate, and the return of Costello Van Stienis, older and wiser, and looking for a win over the legend that is Douglas Lima. We start the evening, though, at light heavyweight. Jose Gugu Augusto looking to put some dramatic recent memories behind him as he faces a fighter on a roll in the shape of Simon Biong, who's on the lookout for another Bellator win. John, this is a guy who knows how to get it done. Oh, if you're thinking about Simon Biong, this man is so physically gifted. He is on a roll, taking out Luke Trainer. And here, just pounding his opponent, looking for the stoppage. He is on a roll, but he's got a big-time opponent in Jose Augusto standing across from him. The tail of the tape, then, between the light heavyweight Simon Biong and Jose Augusto. And, John, you want to look at that huge reach advantage. And you can see that an Augusto is a stand-up fighter who uses his length and range very well, but he's got to get through that 80-inch reach advantage that Simon Biong possesses. Well, you know what I'm going to say next. Let's head for the first time this evening to Michael C. Williams. For all those joining us around the world, we welcome you to Paris, France, as we get set now for Bellator 296 to kick off the evening here at Accor Arena. We get the prelims underway now with three five-minute rounds in the light heavyweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at six foot three, weighing in 205.2 pounds. His professional record seven wins, four losses from Paulo Alfonso Bahia Brazil. He fights out of a Natal, Rio Grande do Norte. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting Jose Gugu Augusto. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot five, weighing in 205.6 pounds as a professional. Nine victories, just two defeats by way of Cameroon. He fights out of Genova, Italia, presenting Simon Hemle Biong. And the referee in charge, Jacob Montalvo. So this is quite a fight to get us underway. Could be real fireworks here at the start of the evening. Certainly if Jose Augusto's recent outings have been anything to go by, John. I'll tell you what, he has had some fantastic fights. Yes, he is only one and two in Bellator. But his two losses, one, he had Anthony Rumble Johnson out almost. And Rumble was able to come back from that. And then he had an unbelievable contest with Alex Easy Polizzi. It was back and forth. One of my favorite fights. Yeah, that was terrific. We're in for a treat if we have anything like that here. Simon Bionk, well, that win over Luke Trainer at Wembley in London looks better and better now. And he's building quite a reputation. And you just feel if he can do something spectacular here, a couple of really big wins, then we could see him on a main card at some point. Got a great backstory, really likable fellow as well. Yeah, very athletic, comes from a basketball background, Whoa! but you can't take shots like that for too long. 
needs to respond. It's all about if you're going to be engaged in that moment where you're both throwing, you want to be the one landing the shots at the end. Left hook and then a right Which hook from Beyong, yeah. And this is where Beyong has an advantage. Physically, he is stronger than Augusto. And on the ground, he is very good. So he wants to be on the ground in the top position using ground and pound. The question is, can he get it there? Good use of the knee there as well from Beyong. One of those fighters is always working to improve, looks at his weaknesses, tries to make them better. And he's been doing that. You've seen that from his fights here in Bellator. He's been just better and better with every fight. But his, this matchup with Augusto is going to say a lot because Augusto is a tricky fighter. He doesn't have a ton of fights, but he is very seasoned and he fights smart. It's a good classic one-two there from Augusto. Bion says he wants to learn to react to everything in the cage. He calls himself a, an MMA opportunist. He took a big right hand, then another from Augusto. Good back and forth in this opening couple of minutes. But Augusto's getting that range down, and those two right hands landed. He saved the one thing you're not seeing from Bion, no head movement at all. That thing is right on the center line, and that's why Augusto was able to target so easily. Yeah. John mentioned that on, Simon Bion was a very good basketball player. But then he switched to MMA at the remarkably late age of 25, but a natural athlete, natural sportsman, extremely hard worker. He's an artist as well. Got a little bit of a knee coming up into the groin of Augusto here. Augusto, of course, has time here. As he's entitled to. He's going to be okay. He's signaling to uh, to restart things. Okay, chin down. Well, here you go, John. A very nice move by Jacob Montalvo. You can see he's putting him back okay, in the position. Watch. Wrist control. A couple of good shots. Nice. A little bit off of the shoulder. Didn't land. Just glancing. But nice move by the referee. Gusto's the one that had the control of the position. He got the foul. Don't take away his position. Yeah, that was a really good reading of an awkward situation, potentially. Okay, let's go. Keep your left hand up. If it comes in, drop the left too hard. Well, they both had their hands go already in this opening round. Already you look at it and think it potentially is a hard one to judge. But of course, a lot of time for things to happen here. But you can see that right now, Augusto is the one that feels way more comfortable right now on the feet. He's throwing the cleaner, crisper shots. He's the one dictating when those engagements occur, and he's also the one landing the shots on the exit. There you go. Great timing again. Beyond missed, and he punished him with that right hook. Another big right hook there. That hurt him bad. You can see that shook him. Yeah, Beyond taking a backward step. Needs to start moving that head, needs to start getting those feet going if he's recovered here. Yeah, Biong in this fight, like I said, I really looked at it. He needs to get this fight to the ground. And if he's unable to do that, this is going to be a difficult matchup with Gugu. Hands up, let's go. Just the timing and the judgment of distance and the finding of range. That's what Augusto's done so well. This has been a perfect fight right now for Jose Augusto. He's been very efficient, hasn't burned any energies, landed the big shots. Never been to the judges in victory or defeat. Augusto, he tends to be explosive, and you can see why. So far, he's had this fight where he wants it. And this is exactly where Beyong wants to be, though, because here's where he can't really be hurt by Augusto, and he has the chance of working for a takedown right now. You know, he's got the overhook on the right-hand side. He wants to switch that around if he can. Get to an underhook, it's going to give him a body lock, but not a lot of time if there's a takedown. Yeah, the seconds tick away here for Beyong. Great work from Augusto in the opening round.
Well, we can take a look at some of the action, John, from that opening round. And you can see right there, that second right hand landed, didn't land full power, but it, it connected. Here you get another one. Beautiful right hand land, and you see right away, Beyond going for the clinch throughout that first round. Jose Augusto was able to land that right hand multiple times, and it was the big difference. Yvonne Hippolyte in that Simon B on corner, and we need to talk to him about that head movement. They need to work out a way to get Augusto down. So round two of what always looked like being an entertaining fight, an intriguing one, and it certainly is that. Augusto with excellent work in the opening round and work for this man, Simon Biong, to do. Come on, Chinda, let's stand. Let's stand. Step in. Let's work with the guy. Now throw it. Now he goes to the leg kicks as well. Really intelligent so far, this from Augusto. Not that that's surprising. See, and it's Augusto that is initiating these. You're seeing Bion trying to counter, but he's so worried about that right hand touching him that that counter is not being effective right now. Don't show him. Let it come in. Missed with it that time. The other thing he's doing intelligently is he's setting it up behind that jab, isn't he? And as I said in that first round, John, he's found the range perfectly, Augusto, but Bion trying to get to work here. Not a bad idea by Beyond to get into that clinch, drive him into the cage, dirty box him, start to use those knees, start to use that head placement. Look what he's doing with his head right now. That's all great clinch work. I mentioned he's an artist, he studies fine art. Beyond, he says he doesn't recognize himself when he watches his fights back, turns into another person. He needs to turn into someone who can get Josie Augusto down here. And that was very smart by Augusto. You saw he got the body lock, he got the double unders, but immediately broke off because he's been doing so much better at range. Feels like there's a difference as well, even at this early stage in the, the body language and the breathing, Augusto looks effortless right now. Because he's not working hard, everything's flowing for him. That's better from that a nice shot. Put a few shots together as well, backed up Augusto. Corner telling him to keep the pressure up to make use of that good work. Really important moments, these in the fight. You feel that Augusto would have won that opening round. Biong has to win this one clearly to try and set up a third and final round. Well, we're talking about, you know, Augusto wasn't breathing hard at all. Well, this is a way to make him breathe hard. This is a way to start to get him tired, maybe slow down that stand-up attack that he's been so successful with when he's at range. Bion describes this as a mind over body sport, says his greatest strength is his mindset. And that will be important now. No sense of panic or worry or anything like that. Put it behind you and get to work. That's what his corner is telling him to do. Well, he's working hard. There's no doubt about it. It may not look like a lot to people out there, but there's a whole lot going on, and there's a lot of energy being expelled. Augusto back to his feet easily there. Well, it was Augusto that hit that takedown attempt. He went for the Uchimata. He got it to the ground, but wasn't able to actually roll it over and maintain the top position. We'll see if Augusto goes for that again. He's got the overhook on that left arm. You'll see him swing that leg right in between the legs of Biong. Now he's not in that position at all. Now he's got the underhook on that side. That's what they want from Biong is more work from that position. There's a right hook there again from Augusto. Really smart shot that on the break. And again, on the exit, who's the one landing the shots? 
Oh, that was a clean shot that Biong landed too. And Augusto responded with a left uppercut. He's hurt Biong yeah. again there. Really good combination from Josie Augusto. This is the exact Augusto we've seen so many times. He hurts his opponent. He has him in trouble. And then all of a sudden things start to turn on him a little bit. He's got to maintain that. Once he hurts somebody, don't let him off the hook. He said that against Polizzi, he was worried about looking for a flashy finish. He sort of criticized himself because of that. And I wonder if maybe we're seeing that here. I'll tell you what, he almost had how many of them against Polizzi. He had him hurt so many times. But you leave a good fighter in there long enough, you're giving them a chance to find an opening, and that's what happened with Polizia. Gusto that started that, Biong responding off of it. Watch the elbow. That's a nice clean elbow right off the forehead. Biong responds, which is what you want to see. Don't let him be the one that's getting away with that last shot. That was that left hand that landed. Biong getting a couple of his own in there. Close second round. took my question away from me there. He knew what I was going to ask you anyway. So you said close second round. How have you got it at the moment? Have you got it 1-1 to tee up the third? You know, I'll give it 1-1 because there was a couple of shots that Augusto landed that were good, especially that elbow in tight coming out of the clinch. But overall, Biong landed some really good shots too. So he maintained the control of the clinch. He landed more with the knees. I'll give him the second round, but definitely a close round. Could have gone the other way. Great respect between these two. Augusto applauded Biong there as the crowd uh, got to their feet. Augusto trying to nice third round. slick elbow there. And there's one again. That's been on for him, hasn't it? Yeah. He's using that pressure that Biong is bringing against him by using those elbows. And there's a knee as well from Augusto. Again, the timing has been excellent, but that's the problem. He needs to get himself back to his feet. That's a great move by Augusto. He did not hang out. He did not hesitate. Worked to get himself back up. We'll see if he can get the hands separated here. Young, very difficult as far as the strength factor. He's very strong, so it's not easy to just separate those hands. You can see that's what Augusto's working to do. Young trying to get him away from the cage as well. He walks himself back there. Gusto did grab the cage there again. Montalvo was right on it, grabbed it, pulled that hand off of it. But if you see him grab the cage again, you might see Montalvo. He's scraping right along the cage there again, trying to use every bit of friction that he can to keep himself from going down. Now he's able to turn his body back and face Mion. And he knows that there's nothing good for him down there. Going his way. So far, but that could all change. So, and you're seeing Biong reach for the leg there, but he's going to have to get easy. They're going to have to go for that single, which he's not doing. He's actually looking for the double, but he cannot get his hands even close to getting clasped together. So that second ticks now. This becomes Augusto's longest pro fight. Biong continues that pressure, trying to wear him down. Now he's going for the single leg. See if he can run the pipe. Doesn't have it. Good smart work this from Augusto, isn't it? The defense. Augusto's doing a good job of keeping himself on his feet, but he's not being offensive at this point. 
Here he starts to try to get a little offensive with the elbows, but just like he got those double unders before, worked for the pummel, got his hands inside and pushed off. That's what he needs to do right here. He needs to separate from Beyond. Nice elbow up inside. And that was one way, just creating that little bit of space. Real success with those elbows. Very good, up tight and close, is bringing that elbow across. See him way better. Look at the hand placement. There's your difference. You saw that beautiful framing by Augusto. Throws the elbow. See his blood to the mouth of Biong as well. Those elbows have really taken their toll on him. So often this sport is about can you make it your kind of fight? And that's been the story here as we head for the final minute. Nice knee to the midsection by Augusto. You can see the damage it's doing on Biong as well. The blood's on the body of Augusto. And even though Biong is the stronger, Augusto's been good enough. Biong holding on to the fence there as Augusto tried to turn him. Talks of that warrior spirit, Biong, he needs it all here. Another elbow, yeah. He's building those up. Biong looks exhausted here. Final seconds. Oh, what a way to start the evening. Last year in Paris, it was explosive all the way early on, but that was really good technical. Great watch and a very good performance from uh, Josie Augusto. It's a grueling, grueling matchup as far as the way that was fought, but Augusto really came out. Big elbows, that was the big difference in that third round. Landed some clean shots. One, two, right there. Nice knee coming up the middle. Jose Augusto used really good technique and having that pressure coming at him and doing things to make the pressure of somebody else work for him. Brazil! Well, you can hear what he was saying there. He's a proud man of Brazil. Well, he's feeling confident in that. I think he should get that win. We hope the judges think the same thing. I know why you're laughing. Yeah, well, you never know. <laughs> but that's how you'd score it. You give it 2-1 on Augusto. Definitely would have a Gusto winner. Well, we, of course, we'll wait for Michael to uh, gather those scorecards and see if uh, the judges agree with John. We always say, I know it almost becomes a cliche, doesn't it? But such enormous respect after those three rounds together. Difference in tiredness as well is notable. Well, Michael is up there and is in position. So let's get up and uh, hear the way they've scored it. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance in tonight's first fight, we'll go now to your three judges at cage side. Your first judge, Eric Colon, scores the fight 30 to 27, while Judge Blake Grice sees it 29-28. Your third and final judge, Sal D'Amato, 30-27. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Jose Gugu. Yeah, it had to be Gugu that got the decision. Unanimous winner, even Beyond New. Terrific performance from him. Now, for the first time this evening, let's head to our team.
It's myself and uh, John McCarthy and, of course, Josh Thompson. And first, Amanda Guerra. Great to see you guys. I, I like that you put me first, Dave. I really do. <laughs> yes, Amanda Guerra here alongside two-time world champ Josh Thompson. Hello. Are you enjoying Hello. Paris? I love Paris. Oh it's amazing here. We've had the best time so yes. far. Let's talk about our main event tonight. Shall we do that? We'll talk about Paris more. Our main event tonight, we have six-time world champ Gegard Musasi going up against Fabian Edwards. Josh, let's put it out there. Whoever wins this, they are going to be able to face the champ, Johnny Eblin. Gegard Musasi he has a chip on his shoulder coming into this because the last time he was in the cage, he lost his belt to Johnny Eblin. What sort of intensity do you expect from him tonight? What happened in that first fight? In the first fight, it was just one of those situations where I think the speed kind of worked against him. He didn't realize how good Johnny Eblin was, but he's got someone in front of him who's got his equal amount of uh, speed in terms of his uh, hand power, his, his kicks, all of those things together. And now he's definitely got to be very careful tonight with Fabian to Edwards because Fabian Edwards is a sniper when it comes to his stand-up. Gegard Musasi has never lost back-to-back -back fights. He said, I didn't prepare for that first one against Johnny Eblin, but I sure as hell prepared for this one. Talk to me about Fabian Edwards here. Look, obviously his brother Leon Edwards is a champion right now. This family, they want to boast two champions. This is a chance to get to that point. Look, I've been in a gym when people have brought in world titles, and what happens is everyone's confidence in that gym builds up because there's a world title now. In my gym, we had several world titles, but now this one being the first one for Leon Edwards, his brother's confidence is on high right now because he knows what we're doing in the gym is working, and I know I could be next. Dave, it's going to be incredible. That is our main event tonight. Also, we have the continuation of the lightweight World Grand Prix, but to continue the prelims, we'll send it back down to you. Thanks very much indeed, Amanda. Yeah, absolutely looking forward to this next one. Could be fun. I think it might be explosive. We enjoyed plenty of that on this card early on last year. Myself and John could barely move for action in those uh, early fights. Many happy memories. And Burama Kamara, who was involved in one of those fights, beat Victor de Lima Vercher in a terrific up and down opening round. I'm sure you guys have watched it. If you haven't, then make sure you take a look. But before you do that, watch this. Because Kamara went to Milan in October. The wheels momentarily came off his Bellator journey. Nicolo Soli, the Monkey King, was too good for him in a close fight. He is, of course, huge for the weight even for the contracted weight six foot four and a sense that at the age of 25 he might just be ready for an exciting run he's certainly very very watchable it's two parisian fighters settling a bit of a local difficulty watch out for roman debian's big right hand and barama kamara will try and match that the tail of the tape then at a contract weight of 173 pounds between Roman Debien and Burama Kamara. And John, you wanted to look inevitably at that huge reach disparity. Oh my God, 79 inches at welterweight. I mean, that's heavyweight reach. We're talking, that is huge and is so big. What an eight inch reach advantage can do for you. We'll see if he can make it work. Well, let's get to Michael C. Williams. For all those streaming the fights live in the States on YouTube at Bellator MMA and Showtime Sports, we welcome you to Accor Arena as we get set now here, Bellator 296 to go three. Five minute rounds at a contract weight of 173 pounds. First, introducing the blue corner at five foot 10, weighing in 172.4 pounds. In his Bellator debut, he brings eight wins, four losses, fighting out of Moulin sur Mer. Frauds presenting Roma Nes And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at six foot four, weighing in 171 pounds, even as a professional, five victories, two defeats. He fights out of right here in Paris, introducing Buhamho. And your referee in charge, Kevin McDonald. Well, you never want to predict too much because so much can happen, of course, but this feels like it's going to be explosive because you've got a fighter who trusts in his huge right hand in WN and a fighter with that long, long reach at Southpaw here, Barama Kamara. You suspect 
that something might happen quite soon here, John. Absolutely, and Kamara is, is just remarkable. He's got the skinniest lower legs. He looks, I mean, John Jones looks like a bodybuilder when it comes to the lower <laughs> legs compared to Kamara. He's just very tough, though, and he will throw the kicks. That's exactly what I was going to. Man, for a guy that has a, those land, it's not a lot of meat, but man, there's a lot of bone there, and it lands, and it's got power. I enjoyed hearing Kamara say before this that all he's got is a right hand. Yeah, okay, but it's a pretty good right hand. It's a darn good right hand, and when he throws it, he throws it with a lot of intensity, so... Still, he's got to earn the right to throw it. Because with that long reach, Kamara using the jab as well as the legs. Kamara being smart, use that length. This is, you know, he is the epitome of what Josh Thompson will talk about when we talk about tall, long, and lanky. That is Kamara. And when you have an advantage, just like he does with that reach, use that jab. Keep him outside of that range. Good inside leg kick there, though, from Debian. That's a good tactic to use. Big left hand, though, from Kamara. Debian missed with the right, loaded up on it. Kamara made him pay all right. Debian keeps on moving towards the power of Kamara. He tries to step to his left, but he automatically starts circling back to his right. And that's into the power of Kamara, both with the kick and the left hand. Right hand from Debian nearly landed there. Didn't land flush, though. And you can see how Kamara's moving him with his footwork. He's creating that pressure where Debian doesn't feel like he can move to his left and automatically responds by moving towards that power. That was good speed, though. He got in and out that time, John Very Debian, nice. and did land that right hand. Is he starting to deal with this range of Burama Kamara? Both got a lot of fans in here as well. It was uh, great as they walked. For the knee that time, Kamara. Debian really needs to use his footwork to get himself inside. It's all about timing. You're looking at the movement of Kamara. Use your footwork to get you in range so those shots will land. Nice by De Debian right there. He's starting to get the feel of. He's looking at the range. He's starting to get that feel of when he can step inside. So getting a little bit better, but he still keeps on circling towards the power. But he has reacted well, hasn't he? Because yep. Kamara came out and looked dominant for a minute or so. But a good reaction from Debian. Kamara switching stances as well. Look at that body kick. That jab is a weapon. And he's good with it both sides, whether he's southpaw or orthodox. He's throwing a really snappy, effective jab. Seen a couple of times, though, John, when Kamara walks forward, which I'm not sure he needs to do, that's when Debian looks like he can cause damage. Well, if there's one thing that Debian can really take advantage of, watch the jab hand because it doesn't matter if it's left or right but now the left when Kamara throws it he does not snap it back in that same you know rail that it's coming out on he drops it down that's always an opportunity for your counter see how it dropped down to his shorts watch when he throws it and you'll see that hand dropping down you're in that Debbie in corner <laughs> Daniel Warren Grand man of uh, French MMA, you'd be telling him to try and time that big right hand over the lazy withdrawal of the left jab anyway. Little things where you get a little bit lazy can be used effectively against you. Debbie Ed just threw a huge haymaker and missed by Miles. Great for the crowd though, because it's what they come to see, of course, nothing wrong with that. But you really got to be impressed with Kamara as far as he's sticking to his game plan. His game plan was obviously we're going to stick and move and just pressure and continue to use the range. And that's what he's done.
take a look at some of the action then, Joan, from what you've seen in that opening round. And right there was one of the counters you saw from WN. You saw him throw that right hand, went off the forehead. He landed it. He was a little bit off balance, too. But overall, it was Kamara that was able to land the more effective shots as we were watching throughout the round. Kamara landed continuously with the jab, that straight left when he was in the southpaw position. He was effective with it. Got to give him the round. Debian I might have heard it when Michael uh, introduced him. Goes by the nickname Neige, which is the French word for snow, and that's because he likes the cold and because he loved the ice man. <laughs> so he models himself on. You can see that. <laughs> Using those kicks well, isn't he, Debian? The legs are a target. He just needs to come out. No, notice when he's throwing that, that jab out. His chin's going up. So he's, one thing he's going to have to change is keep that chin down towards his chest. Yeah, he's reaching far, and so I understand why it's happening. Oh, right hand from Debian was a stunner. Kamara's hurt badly here, but gets oh, back yeah. to his feet. And Debian looks for the finish and gets it. Ice cold from Roman Debian. What a finish that was. And he pulls off the biggest win of his career in stunning fashion. Kamara a little bit upset with that stoppage. He does not feel like that fight should have been stopped. He's uh, not a happy man right now, but he gave the opportunity for Debbie Ann to land that shot. And we talked about the right hand. Look, he's got power in it. When he lands it, it has an effect. <laughs> yeah, Kamara, like you said, wasn't happy at all with the stoppage at first glance with the naked eye. Well, you tell us, John. Well, you can take a look. He lands that right hand. That was a beautiful shot. Well placed. Kamara tries to recover here. He gets back to his feet. His feet get a little crossed up. And then he, land, he gets hit with another shot down. The problem is referee actually trying to be out of the way kind of runs into them right here. When they go back down, is a little close. Kamara needs to look at himself as far as if you're going to get back up, you got to protect that chin. He turned, he got hit with that big shot. Not a bad stoppage by Kevin McDonald. It was that last shot yep. on the ground. Kamara that's, might that, feel he was and that's when he, reacting. You could see that's when McDonald went in for the stoppage. It was a big shot, totally reasonable. Well, Debian's hyped up here, and <laughs> you can understand that. Don't blame him. Absolutely. Why not? Fantastic win for him. Kamara will come again. Let's get to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end. One minute, four seconds. Round number two. The winner by knockout, Loma Nish. Just get the feeling there might be a party in the Roman Debian camp tonight. He's got that kind of feeling about him. Great win for him. Let's get back to Josh and Amanda. Dave, incredible finish there later on this evening. We got to tell you, we have the continuation of the lightweight World Grand Prix here at Bellator. We are known for our explosive tournaments. Here's the bracket where it stands right now. Alexander Shabli moving on. Usman Nurmagomedov moving on. The fight you're going to see tonight is your bottom left there. Brent Primus, our former champ in this division, going up against a fighter that John says is the best fighter to ever come out of the country of France. And Mansour Bonner, he's 
is going to be fighting, of course, in front of his hometown, a hometown crowd here of Paris tonight. Josh, let's talk about this. Winner gets to face Usman Nurmagomedov. You got Mansoor Banari, who's been facing, the, or chasing, excuse me, the Nurmagomedov family his entire career. Brent Primus, though, a chip on his shoulder coming into this. He initially was not in this tournament. Some of the best grapplers we have in Bellator, does either one of them have an advantage? Both of them are fantastic on the ground. I think both of them are top the top, probably two 155 pounders in the world on the ground. But their styles, I wish the way they attack on the ground is different. Barnaby being very good from the top, making transitions to get to the back. He loves to get to the back. Whereas Brent Primus is very good off of his back, using more of a rubber guard, but is also a savage on top. So when I look at these two, I kind of believe that they may end up canceling each other out on the ground and realizing that, hey, why put myself in jeopardy? I mean, we can actually stand and bang this thing out. You see the height advantage there with Mansoor Barnaby. How much is that going to make a difference in this fight? Uh, look, Mansoor Barnaby is someone who is just tall, long, and lanky. His body style is very similar to Usman Nurmagomedov. And I think Brent Primus is going to have to deal with that reach, that range. 79-inch reach for a lightweight is insane. I know Brent Primus said he's taking this fight so seriously. It's the hardest he's ever trained. Many wondering if he overtrained for this fight. We'll find out later tonight. We'll talk about that later because I know you got feelings on it. For now, we'll send it back down to Dave and Big John. Thanks very much indeed, guys. One thing someone was saying to me about French fight fans is that they come early. They fill the arena up early, and boy, are we seeing that here so far. It, it was a sellout very, very quickly. This 12 and a half thousand, not quite full yet, but goodness me, I tell you, it's not oh, far it's away, and they fast. are making some noise. Next, we're going to see Georges Sassou and Azale Jude, who always excites people. On his way to the cage now, much talked about. There is just that suspicion Ajuj might end up being one of those gym fighters, but we'll see. I don't know. I'll tell you what, Azale Ajuj is a good fighter. And you're taking a look at both of these are young, aggressive fighters coming in at a catch weight of 150 pounds. That was agreed upon. So this is not in our normal weight classes, but this should be fireworks. Well, let's get to the voice now of the Bellator cage to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight here at Bellator 296, the prelims continue now as we go three five minute rounds at 150 pounds. First, we introduce the blue corner at five foot nine, weighing in 149.6 pounds. His professional record for wins, two losses. He fights out of Paris, France, presenting George Sassou. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot, weighing in 150 pounds even. His professional record, five victories, one defeat. Fighting out of Dublin, Ireland. He hails originally from Paris, France, presenting a Zell, the Sultan Ajuj. And your referee in charge, Jacob Montalvo. So we had real fireworks last time. We may well see them here again. A huge with that win over Liam McCracken. It was the battle in Dublin of the two talked about gym fighters, one from the Irish scene, one from the scene in the northwest of England. A huge he did it, but he made some poor decisions along the way. Let's see if he gets back to what he's good at. You know, he, he may not have made all the right decisions, but he's a young fighter, and you got to expect that young fighters who are super explosive are going to make those mistakes at times. Nice, nice aggression by George Sassou here. Yeah, really good start from him. And he really fancies this, George Sassou, and he was getting on as usual a bit at the weigh-ins. You could tell there was something there. Yeah, they try and overwhelm they, him. They did not like each other too much, but you know that's that's okay. You're going to be able to punch each other in the face here, and that's that's the best part of our sport. It doesn't matter about what you say, what you talk about. You got to go in there and prove yourself. We know that both guys are very capable in the stand-up, and it's a real question of we saw uh, from a juge against McCracken. We saw he actually had a good ground game. 
He was very effective down there. Stopped a guy who was great with the submission. So this is not a good area right now for Sasu. It's a real thrill this for Ajuzi. He is a Frenchman from Avignon down in the south, but to be fighting here in Paris, all that hard work that he's put in and his family put in to support him. It feels very, very special for him. The Jews is going to want to get Sassou's back off of the cage onto the canvas. Anytime you're seeing George Sassou with his back on that cage, he's not in a terrible position because he's able to instantly drop a foot down, drop a hand down, get himself back up. Nice job of passing those legs, but again, he still wants to try to pull those hips off of that cage. And you see right away, Sasu being able to get himself back up. That cage is a great balance point once you learn how to use it. Both these fighters and lost on their Bellator debut, so both have built back from there. Particularly Ajuj, who's now three and one with uh, Bellator. This is only Sasu's second fight with the promotion. Been out with injury. First fight for him since November 2021, and that's always telling to see how he comes back. Notice how Ajuj has got that right leg, figure four, keeping it off of the mat. You're going to see Sasu have to try to get that leg free for him to get himself back to where he can get to a standing position. That figure four leg, you know, lock if you want to call it, or just the ability to control the legs. A guy named Nurmagomedov has made that a very popular technique among all fighters today. I remember as well with Ajuj that this is a guy who came into MMA with kickboxing skills. This is someone fleet-footed and athletic on the feet, and it's fascinating to see his development. And like I said, when he fought McCracken, we saw him on the ground a lot, and he was in trouble at part of it, but he also used the ground to his advantage and did some great work there, so you know he's got skill. So he's really worked with a more offensive mindset with his grappling and with his wrestling. Worked really hard on it at SPG in Dublin, where, of course, you ask any fighter from there who the star of the gym is, and it's him. They'll all be watching this, all be cheering him on. They, they do all say, who's the guy of the future? And they all say, it's Aju. You notice that use of the head right now as he's driving Sassu's head down towards that canvas. Very smart technical work. Keep him from being able to slide himself back on that onto that cage. Sassu has done a very good job defensively though. He's kept himself from being damaged. He's only taken a couple of shots in here. Nice elbow. Yeah, he managed to just get that separation that time, didn't he, Ajuj? He's going for that. Oh, he lost it. He was attacking the neck, wasn't he? He's still on it. Still is, yes, Sasu got seconds here. There's the pressure, you can see it really well. It's tight, but Sasu's gonna, he's gonna make it through it. Juj goes to the elbow, beautiful elbow strike right off the forehead of Sasu. And then he decides, I'm gonna go for this guillotine. He gets that locked and he tried to get his leg free. He wasn't able to. He gets the over on the far side with his left foot. Just not enough time and space to make it work. So 
a good dominant opening round from Isaiah Lajuj. Chelsea lost a split on his Bellator debut against Ilias Belaid. He felt he gave the fight away. He almost feels, I think, tonight like he's restarting. Restarting against a very good opponent. Well, that fight against Bel Belaid is outstanding in the stand up. You know, and so, obviously, if he was able to stay with him, it's telling you how good Sasu is on his feet. And you can see he's comfortable there. Yeah, hand down at his side. He doesn't fear anything in the stand-up. He is ready to go, so. Oh, that was a clean, hard kick to the body. Great speed on his feet. Ajuj just looking for those angles. Making Sasu fall short there. And again, he is so sharp. Yeah, Sasu is following a little too much. He's trying to get on, in on a juge. A juge using good footwork, moving himself both, switching stance, southpaw and orthodox. Good elbow there from a juge. <laughs> Mixes things up so well, doesn't he, Azela Juge? And he does it with such speed. from Sasu. Nice clean lead up with him. Landed the kick there, but then as huge just tumbled. Oh. Makes a run steady, I think, for a moment, or was it a slip? I think it was more of a slip, but landed a clean elbow strike in there, too. Sasu just walking towards him. Putting a lot of pressure, but he needs to put just a little bit more output with the strikes. It's more than coming forward. Does look vulnerable to those kicks, those sharp kicks Boy, from that huge. But I can tell you, as fast as you're seeing a juice go backwards, that burns a lot of energy. Oh, and the legs are unsteady of Sasu. Just yeah. straight right hand, I think, and then he heard looks it. for the kick. Oh. And again, oh. and then he goes to the body. Oh, oh. the speed. Class, all of those kickboxing skills, then the knee, and now he goes for the finish. He's got the neck here, Ajuj, and this time he's got a lot of time. Didn't have it, man. I'll tell you what, George Sasu has got granite in his chin because he took some massive shots. Mark on the eye of a juge as well. He's just taken a little bit of damage too. This is job. grueling though, isn't it? Great job by a juge getting himself back to his feet. He gets the takedown with the trip. This is where you start to take over a fight because he had Sasu hurt. Sasu gets back to that point where he's got himself safe. And now he's underneath on the bottom. Big elbow strikes. Clean. And you can't help but think how much is in their gas tanks here. And you can see the mark on the body where the kick landed. Another elbow from a juge. Sasu digging it. had that underhook. He was able to try to get himself up. A juge clamps down on it, takes it away. Very nice job of base and positioning from a juge. And it wasn't just that Sasu took the shot, he took a series of them. As you say, absolute granite. So impressive. I mean, the shots that he was able to withstand there, the spinning, heel kick, all of it. Ajuj is managing to do damage here. Starting to look a bit like relentless damage. You can see he's getting the worn down. You can't, you can't continuously just take big shots and just, oh, it's not going to have an effect. It's going to affect your ability to perform. 
but he got himself through the round. Take a look at some of these shots. That's a clean inside elbow by a juge. Lands a beautiful little check left hook. Then he goes for the spinning heel kick, lands it up against the neck area. Right hand. He definitely had Sasu hurt here. Boom, right up there. Man, that is, he had his hand up to block. The heel went right past it. Beautiful right hand again. We're just going to see that one more time. Boom! Almost a brachial stun right on that brachial nerve that runs down your neck. Question mark kick coming up. Beautiful round by Juge. And yet Sasu's still there. <laughs> tough, <laughs> tough man. Two defeats, Sasu. One by decision, one by submission. No great surprise, he hasn't been knocked out. <laughs> Third and final round. Juge has just been better everywhere so far. But who knows whether the gas tanks will come into play here. Well, we were talking about that relentless pressure, and you're seeing Sasu going right back to it. But does he have the same faculties to be able to defend himself from the attacks of a Jews if he's going to be that forceful coming forward? Once again, a Juge making Sasu just follow him a bit. Led with that elbow that time and now he's back to the kicking game tried to go into the foot sweep see if he could get an easy takedown didn't quite happen just need to be careful here a juge spinning back fist there from a juge such nice rhythmical work from him And here's where George Sassou has had a problem. Every time he gets into the clinch, he gets turned, put onto the cage with his back, and he's been taken down. So Juge has definitely had the ability to get Sassou where he wants him on the ground. Taking the back position like he just did, not the smartest move. Saw that against McCracken a couple of times, yes. didn't we? And a lot of times you'll get you get a guy that he feels comfortable on his back. He's in training and he feels like, hey, I can do good work here in MMA, especially today's MMA. You do not want to be on the bottom. That's not the place to be. You always want to be in the top position. Too many bad things can happen on the bottom. So he's trying to make the most of his position. Uh, Juge can get up. He needs to peel that leg out. And nice job by George Sassou to put pressure on it. Heavy hip pressure. That made a Juge go up. Oh, I just can't stand up here. And now he's got his back on the canvas again. Half guard. And then those hammer fists. Sassou, the best position he's been in during the fight. It's whether he can exploit it. No doubt about it, this is the best position he's had during this fight. Final couple of minutes here. Ju just dominated much of it. Can Sasu just turn that tide? Sasu able to land those right hands there. Sasu doing a very nice job, putting a lot of pressure down in that side control. He's controlled the position of a Juju. Juju's tried to work to get himself out multiple times. Hasn't been able to get there. 
But Sasu's got to really figure out, I need to end this fight. He's got to be down two rounds. Yeah, it just doesn't feel like there's any debate about that. So he's got to look for a finish in this final minute. Otherwise, it's just honor. It's not the win. Jude's trying to use that cage to maneuver his position here. So Sue stepped into half guard there to be able to control the position. But with 35 seconds left, he's got to land some big shots. He needs to think about going to elbows. Looks to the body to try and create that gap to land something big. It's it's now for you, George Chassou. It has to be now. Chassou's just taken a bit of damage, but nothing that's going to get him out of there. Final efforts here from Sassu. Elbows from Ajuj. Ajuj does get to the end. the decision then let's get to michael c williams ladies and gentlemen for the decision we'll go to your three judges at cage side your first two judges sal the model and chris lee both see the fight exactly the same at 29 to 28 while your third and final judge eric cologne scores it 29 to 27 all have it for the winner by unanimous decision Azel the Sultan Ajuj. Ajuj marches on, wins it by unanimous decision and moves to six and one and improves all of the time. Well, we can get now to uh, Amanda Guerra and Josh Thompson. Now, Josh wants to drone on about lightweights all night, pretty much, <laughs> but uh, we're going to talk about the middleweights, I think, Amanda. It's the best weight class. Are you class. still lightweight, Josh? <laughs> like, wait, what would you be right now? I'm, de I'm definitely not still lightweight. <laughs> You're what, I'm, like a light I'm, heavyweight? I'm, I'm pushing light heavyweight. How about we talk about middleweights? Yeah, you want to talk about that? Let's Look, this, this is a really fascinating fight. It's going to be our second fight of the night. You have a three-time world champion, Douglas Lima, going up against an absolute stud and Costello Van Let's start with Douglas Lima, though. Look, three-time world champ. That was at welterweight, though. And, and Big John said he would come into our meetings and look half-dead, basically. And so he's making 
this switch. He's going back up to middleweight. He's going to have those extra 15 pounds. But Josh, he is on the longest losing skate of his career. What else does he need to do? Look, the extra 15 pounds will give him the confidence for him to go into those later rounds and realize he has the energy to keep going. That's kind of what was happening to him at the welterweight. Is it sure he has power? He possesses great leg kicks. He's got good takedown defense. But as the fight went on, he tended to slow down. I think it, now at middleweight, he's going to have the energy in that second and third round to really push through and utilize all the tools and the weapons that he has. Getting older is a pain in the butt. Yeah. But having to cut all of that weight to get to welterweight and killing himself, like Big John was saying, was having an effect on him. I think now at middleweight, we're going to see the, what we used to call it the younger D Douglas Lima. He's got all the tools and the weapons. Now it gives an opportunity to use it. He's going up against somebody who is younger than him. And this is one of your favorite fighters to watch in Castello Van Cetis. If you haven't heard his name for a while, he wasn't fighting because he was injured. His last fight, his first one back, it was a win. It was phenomenal. Why do you like watching him fight so much? How good is he? Well, he fights like a reckless kid. And to be honest, that, those are the type of fights that fans get involved in. I was one of those fighters. I love to fight wild and crazy at times when I was young in my career. He's still young in his career, but the talent is there. All of his tools, he can bring in there the spinning kicks, the spinning back fists, the takedowns, the submissions. He's got a fantastic submission game when he gets to the top position. And the crowd is nuts right now. I can barely <laughs> hear myself talk. But Douglas, uh, Douglas Vestinas is someone that has all the tools and the weapons to get the finish and be the first one to ever finish Douglas. He's also been doing some acting, some shows in the Netherlands. You were doing some acting uh, back in that, LA got, or something. He's got that James Bond villain look. He died at the end of the fight, or at the end of the fight, at the end of the show. No, that's not going to happen tonight. Uh, we're going to send it back down to you, Dave. Thanks very much indeed, Amanda. And I can reveal as well that uh, Amanda asked Costello Van Steenis to give Josh some acting tips, which uh, <laughs> didn't necessarily end well, but we'll watch this space, I think, with that one. Well, as the guys were saying, places filling up and the Glaswegian Keir Harvey gets the opportunity of a lifetime next. He goes here against a fighter in the shape of Fabakahi Djata, who has some bad memories from this arena to put to rest. The two of them getting it on here at Featherweight. So the tail of the tape then at Featherweight between Keir Harvey and Fabakahi Djata and John. Well, you wanted to take a look at both of them here and just see how they match up. Well, and the whole thing is they're very similar all across the board, both very young fighters, and that's where you're looking at both having some experience, but this is the big lights, and they've got a lot to prove. But I can tell you, Fabacar Diata, one of the strongest featherweights I've ever seen. Let's get now, then, to Michael C. Williams. And now, ladies and gentlemen, tonight here at Bellator 296, we'll go to three five-minute rounds in the featherweight division. Introducing the blue corner at five foot nine, weighing in 145.8 pounds, making his Bellator debut. He stands with five wins, two losses, two draws, fighting out of Glasgow, Scotland, Kip Harvey. And across the cage is the adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot nine, weighing in 145.4 pounds as a professional. Eight victories, one defeat from Abapinihe, France, presenting Fabacarhi Jetta. And your referee in charge, Blake Grice. Well, Fabakari Jatta, who is very well supported here from Aubervilliers, just in the outskirts of Paris, facing a, a relatively late change of opponents that he's had to adjust in his camp. And as for Keir Harvey, well, you don't often get fighters coming into the cage having drawn their last two, but that's the situation he's in. One in Finland, one in South Africa. That's a circuit he's been fighting on, getting fights where he can. And they're both, as John was saying beforehand, built up very good records. Yeah, Keir Harvey's very, he's a good fighter. He's got fast hands. His biggest problem is in the wrestling area. He's good on the ground, but to get the fight there is where the problem is. And it's the one area that I can tell you that Giada is very good. His wrestling is outstanding. Coming from a guy that really never wrestled. He has got a beautiful double leg takedown. He's got super strength when it comes to the body lock takedowns that he uses. So. 
Keir Harvey needs to be very careful of getting into that clinch situation with Giada. I mentioned the bad memories for Giada here. There was the defeat by Jordan Barton. It wasn't meant to happen that. It was a similar atmosphere. He was well supported and he wants to put that right. It's a good shot from Giada. Very really nice. sharp, accurate work, isn't it, John? Strong jab right there, landing. You know, sometimes you see a jab and it's it's crisp, but it's just not that kind of stinging shot. What you're seeing from Giada right now, that jab when it's coming out, that's hurting Harvey, and you can you can see it all over his face right now. There's already damage to the nose there of Harvey because he's so accurate. We're talking about a lazy jab, weren't we, earlier on in the evening? Just a finger there, a poke. Little poke to the eye right there. And he's happy to carry on, but Blake Rice just uh, resetting things. And all that damage that you're seeing right now on Keir Harvey's face, that came from that jab that he's landed multiple times. It's a stiff, hammering jab. So we're back underway. Harvey will have been relieved, I think, with uh, that little delay. He has to adjust something because when a fighter like Giata can't miss with a punch, just again there he lands it. Life becomes difficult. Yeah, but you're seeing very good head movement by Giata. This, he's using his feet to get in and out, control the space. And watch, he doesn't just leave his head on the center line when he comes in to throw. See that little dip you're seeing? Everything just bring that head off of the center line. He's feeling pretty good out there right now. Oh, he looks to switch to the kick. It's interesting. Giata's established the jab, hasn't he? And now he's looking to throw bigger shots behind it. Yep. Well, great to hear from uh, Hit Burble there. Bellator Paris off to a banging start. You're not wrong. I'll tell you what, Keir Harvey's got a chin, though, because he's taking a couple of good shots. He keeps on winging his... He's throwing hard. He said he was going to finish it with a left hook. He likes that punch, Keir Harvey. Giata needs to be careful because Harvey does bring power. That's good work again, though, from Giata. And you can see the mess he's making here of Keir Harvey's face. He might have bust that nose quite early on. He is pulverizing his face right now. Keir Harvey just in the first three minutes of this fight, his face is a mess right now. Yeah, so he's, trying to keep, to go. And he's trying to keep his hands up high. You see how he's he's framing his face with his hands because he knows that he's getting hit. Oh, right hand there from Giata. Again, he sets it up behind the jab. Yep. Harvey might as well gamble, and Harvey looked for the nice takedown and got it. Nice job by Harvey. He doesn't quite, yeah, his butt's on the ground, but he needs to establish that takedown, do something with it right now. He's got a long ways to come back in this round. It's a, nice, it's a really nice thought process of reaching out and taking that hand. But again, this is what I'm saying about he hasn't established that takedown. Yes, his butt's on the ground, but nothing was done with that takedown. So dominant here, Giata. Good, hard knees to the thigh by Giata. And I've said it before, Giata reminds me of a young Matt Hughes, built the same way as far as, you know, just you, you look at him move and you just see the muscle fiber moving, no fat on his body, just strong as an ox. Crazy. There he goes. And it's late on in the round, but look at this ground and pound from Giata.
got a job to do. Yeah, his face has taken a lot of damage. Kieran Reed and Paul Lally there just doing their best. Let's take a look at some of the action, John. See, that's a good, clean jab. Look at that jab, because it's stiff. See how it's just popping. Kira Harvey back, it's making him lose balance. Beautiful right hand leads to the left. Giada was just a sniper out there, just picking Kira Harvey apart in the stand-up. So they've done their best. Round two, Keir Harvey and Fabakahi Giata. Harvey needs to get on the front foot and somehow has got to try and turn the tide of this fight. How he does it, well, I'm not so sure. I suspect he needs to land something big. Well, if he's going to be in the stand-up, he definitely needs to land more. He hasn't been able to be truly that effective. Right player. hand from Giata, who now goes for the finish. Harvey walked onto that. Nice job as Giata to come around. And look at the power that he's trying to hit him with. He's not trying to land little shots. He's trying to do damage with each one of those. Harvey is clinging on here. The Giata just banging away to the body, banging away to anything he can see here. All of the pain of what happened here last year, I think, is coming out of Fabakahi Giata. Harvey's in desperate trouble. Harvey's doing a good job of trying to hide himself, keep himself safe during this, but Giada is so physically strong. He's just overpowering him, moving where he wants. See if he backs off here, he does. Yeah, Giada wasn't walking into upkick territory there. I thought about it. Well, right now, if you're Giada, you're happy with wherever the fight is. Oh, nice job by Kira Harvey. But look what happened. Goes for that and loses. The position, Jada takes the back. This is what happens when you've eaten a lot of big shots throughout the fight. It just systematically breaks down your ability to stay focused and sharp in the fight. This crowd is pretty much filled up now, and they're right behind Fabakahi Jata every time he lands. We can hear the cheers echoing around this place. Here, Harvey needs to figure out, I gotta get back to my feet here. He cannot stay on the ground. He's eating too many shots. You've got to admire Harvey's toughness, though. Oh, absolutely. He has proven how just mentally tough he is to stay in this and to continue to look for ways to get himself back into being successful against Yada. He can't seem to find a weakness, not one that he can exploit anyway. Again, you see that once that foot is off the ground, you're not going to be getting up. You got to get that foot to the ground. Gets that foot, that hand to the ground, you have the ability to get up. And there's a look. Be careful of the guillotine right now. He's just got time, he's earned himself time to almost think through positions and he's thinking cleverly at the moment. Get back to the jab now. Harvey looked for that left hook. Sneaky left uppercut there from Giata. Not only sneaky as far as it, good footwork. You see him, he doesn't stay right in front. He's throwing and he's moving himself off to the side. Nice shot. That was the left hook and that did just sting Giata. I don't think it buzzed him necessarily, no, but it got his interest. Off balance, but... Left 
took to the body from Harvey. Very nice shot by Kira Harvey. But of course, with his forward momentum and bits of success comes danger. He's been fantastic at the timing on those takedowns. Obviously been working in his wrestling. His change of levels has been really outstanding, but he cannot hold the position once he gets into Gianna. Gianna is able to turn it, come out on top. And this is cumulative damage from Diata. Doesn't look like much, but when you add it all together, you're tiring Harvey out here. He's done very well, if he does, to get into the third here, Harvey. Take a look at some of these shots. Beautiful left-right combination by Giada. Fabakar Giada has just been on fire throughout this fight. He's been accurate, good foot movement. He's used power. And he's used a wrestling game that Keir Harvey's gotten into it, but he's always turned that scramble into being the guy coming out in the top position. So right now, here, Harvey's going to have to figure out something to do in this final round. I got Giada easily up these two rounds. He's done a lot of damage. Third and final round, and Harvey has done tremendously well to even be there. And of course, he's still in there, and he's still wearing four ounce gloves, and he's still got a bit of power. So he's still a danger, but there's that jab again from Giada. If there's one thing that Harvey is is not lacking in, it's heart. He is still in this fight. He is still working hard to try to figure out a way to get at Giada. Very tough Glaswegian, very skillful too. Did you say Glaswegian? Absolutely, he's from Glasgow, yeah. <laughs> I got a man named Podcast Dave, man. He, he's proud of Keir Harvey right now. Oh, I think Keir Harvey hurt himself on that takedown. Ran himself did. into the leg and knee of Giada. That stung him. A horrible position now for Harvey to be in. It's one of those ones, you know, you're, you're doing everything you can to win, and you actually hurt yourself on that takedown attempt. That kind of stung him, and now he finds Giada on his back again, landing hard hammer fist. How much has Harvey got uh, left here? There you go. How much more can the man take? You know, Giada again just taking his time and picking his spot, isn't he? Yeah, and you look at that, no legs involved, all hip ride. You see a heavy hip, see that hip just hooked and slammed into the side of Harvey. He's putting weight down on it. Now he's looking for the hooks. Still unable to do it, but just too physically dominant right now for Harvey to get away. Harvey trying to face him. Got the butterfly guard inside. That's nice. But can he stop those shots? Still just under three minutes left here. Diata way ahead in the fight. There's even an argument for a 10-8 round along the way. The question now, it feels like anyway, is whether he gets him out of there. It is the question because when you're looking Keir Harvey has taken so many shots and been just damaged to the point you, you can't expect the power to be there enough for him to you know, land that one big shot. It would take multiples, and that would mean that Giada was making big mistakes. Not that it can't happen, but not something you should be expecting. Trying to carry Giada, though. Unanimous decision against Dominic Wooding on his Bellator debut. 
was Congo Johnson here in October 2020 and then Nathan Rose beaten as well before the, the setback against Barton. This is someone who has operated at a, a high level with great ambition as well. Jerry Harvey doing a nice job again of trying to protect himself. You saw he turned into Gianna. That's not an easy thing to do is to face him in that position. Referee keeps having a look just when Deanta starts to unload those hammer fists and then Harvey does something to show him that he's still in there, he's still defending himself. Great job, Giada. You see him grabbing the ankle there, driving all that weight forward to put RV back on the canvas. Approaching the final minute of what has been a, I think, dominant display, underestimates it. For all that Harvey's been brave and has made some good decisions defensively, it's been outstanding this from Babakahi Giata. Getting stuffed on that, you see Giata coming, coming around again. Again, right now he doesn't have that same position, but He's just too physically strong at this point for Harvey to stop anything that he wants to do. Got to give it to Keir Harvey, though. He has really put up a heck of a fight and made it through. I think he's going to make it through this fight. And if he does, it's all on heart. Now we head for the final 15 seconds. And it's one of those in a strange way for very different reasons. You want to watch them both again and see where they go. They're all favoring Giata, but Man, right at looking the end for pressure here. right at the end. Looking to find a triangle there off his back. Harvey, and as I said, you'd watch them both again, wouldn't you? You'd be interested in their careers. They may go in, in different directions, but they both come out of that with great credit. Oh, absolutely. You're, you know where Giada's going. In the 145-pound division, you're talking about a guy, look, he needs some more experience. There's no doubt about it. There's little errors that he needs to fix. But, man, this kid is a stud. Look at that beautiful right hand. He eats that shot, but when he gets in the top position, he does damage. He's physically incredibly strong. He's got great wrestling where he comes out in the top position and watch the right hand, clean shot. This is a young man. You look at two years down the road, this is a guy that you could see in the top five looking for a shot at the title. And he's only 26 years of age, and isn't that a great picture? That is Fabakahi Giata with his people. They've come here both from Aubervilliers and from all around Paris to cheer him on. And uh, the crowd is just about packed out now. Not surprisingly, they're here to watch the action and they've enjoyed what they've seen here from Faber Kahijiata. Just now a question really of the dotting of I's and crossing of T's, which Michael C. Williams will do shortly. Keir Harvey will have learned plenty about himself as well. You can see quicker than me, Michael getting into the cage just uh, in behind the fighters. That means that we are just about ready. I suspect it's a formality. I suspect it's good news for Faber Kahijiata, but let's find out from Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, we go now to your three judges. Your first two, Eric Colon and Jake Montalvo, both see it the same. 30-27, while your third judge, Chris Lee, scores it 30 to 26. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Fabricati Jetta. Nine and one, and most importantly for him, he gets the win here in Paris. He writes that wrong in his head, and he respects his opponent to Keir Harvey. There was so much to take from that fight, but we're taking a potential star here in the shape of Fabakahi Diante. You will watch his journey with so much interest, I suspect.
we'll be seeing him plenty. Now, some exciting news to you. We're going to have Josh Thompson in commentary in a few moments' time. So there is a reason, if nothing else, to stay tuned. But loads more prelim action coming up as well. Bellatorshop.com and gear up in the same apparel the fighters wear. Sassi versus Edwards today on Chota. And there is so much more to come. Here is our main card. We have Josh Thompson with us in commentary as well. John, I'll come to you in a moment. But Josh, great to have you with us. And we're reunited after all these years too. But tell us what you pick out from this, what you're looking forward to most from this main card. Well, of course, Big John knows who I'm going to pick. I'm going to pick the lightweights. Always going to pick the <laughs> oh, lightweights. Geez. I'm a lightweight homer when it comes to these type of things. Brent Primus, Mansoor Barawi, to me, so much at stake. The chance to potentially fight for the title next against Usman Armagomedov. Huge fight, huge implications. Obviously, I'm looking forward to that. And John, what about you? What jumps out of you? I mean, they all do, don't they? It's a great main card, but yeah, you know you, why I'm asking. What's the real cream in you, there? You've got two there. You know, obviously, I agree with Josh. It's that lightweight Grand Prix. But the Douglas Lima Costello Vanstinas, that's an interesting matchup. But you got to go with Gegard against Fabian because Fabian is so good. And Gegard has been fantastic for so long, but does he still have it? Can he still beat these young Lions? I think he can. So do I. Great stuff from both Josh and from John. But we're ready here for our next event. And this is a much-awaited fight. This they all are, I suppose. But time now for the quiet man of Team Renegade in Birmingham, the excellent technician and always improving Tim Wilde to face Chris Gonzalez, who brings this brilliant wrestling game in a fight which will be all about where it is fought. Let's take a look at what these guys could do. Let's take a look at Chris Gonzalez in action, John. Well, this was Chris Gonzalez against Max Roscoff, and I'll tell you what, he put on a beautiful performance. Roscoff is well known for being just a great wrestler, great jujitsu. Chris Gonzalez used his stand up, used his wrestling when he wanted, and put on a performance. He looked so good that night. The tail of the tape then at lightweight between Chris Gonzalez and Tim Wilder. John, you want to look at the relative ages there? Well, it is because Chris Gonzalez is still a young fighter, even though he's 31, because he had all that wrestling pedigree behind him. Tim Wilde is better at 35 than he has ever been in his career. He is in his prime. Let's get this on. It's going to be good. Let's get to Michael C. Williams. And we welcome all those joining us tonight live throughout the UK on BBC iPlayer as we go now here at Bellator 296 to three five minute rounds in the lightweight division. First, introducing the blue corner at 5 foot 11, weighing in 156 pounds even. His professional record, 15 victories, four defeats, one draw out of Wolverhampton, England, presenting Tim Wilde. And across the cage, his adversary, fighting out of the red corner at 5 foot 11, weighing in 155.4 pounds as a professional. Eight wins, two losses by way of Chicago, Illinois. He fights out of Sacramento, California, USA. Introducing Chris, the Lion Gonzalez. 
In charge, your referee, Blake Grice. So Tim Wilde undefeated in his last four against Chris Gonzalez, building quite a reputation himself. A lot of intrigue about this one. Wilde, of course, excellent on the feet. He's controlled the rhythm and the pace of previous fights. We know where Gonzalez wants this, Josh. Yeah, we do know where he wants it, but that, that makes sense to us, John. But yes. he has fallen in love with his power and, and that's what happens with wrestlers. They realize they have power and they possess it, and wrestling is a very hard thing to do. And so after talking with Uriah Faber last night and Danny Castillo, his coach, he said, look, we're really just trying to push him to get back to his wrestling because that will help set up his stand-up, John. Yeah, and you saw it right away. Two big right hands by Chris Gonzalez has switched to southpaw, but he does not want to be in that position. He's trying to land the knockout shot. Tim Wilde is too slick in the stand-up, and he can take a good shot. Chris needs to figure out, this is a long fight, 15 minutes. Let me use every skill that I have and just systematically pick them apart. But, John, when do the knockouts usually come? When you don't try to hit them. When you're not looking for them. So you just got to let the fight develop in front of you, and the opportunity will present itself. At the moment, Wilde's just taking a look here. Mentioned the quiet man of... Team Renegade just unassuming and tries to go about his business as Gonzalez looks to land a big shot. Well, I said it off of that age part, but since Tim Wilde has been at Team Renegade, he has turned the corner as a fighter. He is so much better now. Wilde putting on the pressure, Gonzalez responding well. There's great respect between these two. The hard thing that's going to be for, for Tim when you're watching this, I think Tim, technically, his stand-up is very clean. But the speed of Chris Gonzalez, speed is so hard to deal with at times. Yeah, the speed and the way he mixes it up, too. He can threaten the wrestling and the takedowns because he's got such good control from the top position. So Tim's got to be cautious of making sure he doesn't lunge in too much and make the takedown easy for him. He's got to make Chris work every single time if the wrestling does come into play. And it is, the, Chris Gonzalez comes from a Greco-Roman background as a wrestler, so you know, it's, he doesn't shoot the for the you know single leg, double legs a lot. He gets into the body lock positions, and when he takes people down, he's got control of their body. We say takedowns, but in Greco-Roman, it's like you're basically buying them a first-class a first class airline ticket through the air, because you're tossing them on their heads most, majority of the time in Greco-Roman wrestling. Six-time Greco-Roman All-American, Chris Gonzalez. Wilde just looks to close that distance. Tim Wilde opening up a little, a little, a little wild with the, you know, the looping punches. Normally, Tim is quicker with throwing straight shots. And Tim Wilde in Birmingham that night, the Brent Primus go-go platter early on in that fight. Myself and Josh were page side calling that. He does look a completely different fighter in terms of of attitude and balance and poise and everything and we're seeing that here another excellent leg kick then from wild and that's going to be one of the key things that he has to utilize on this in this fight because the leg kicks will slow chris gonzalez down in the wrestling department right john absolutely that leg kick will make it to where chris doesn't have that snap in getting into him and it's going to make him think of twice because when you don't feel like you have your legs really under you with strength, you don't want to get into those grappling situations. Where I see the difference already is that Chris is loading up a lot on his shots, and that tends to use a lot more energy, so as the fight goes on, he may tend to get a little bit more tired. Whereas Wild, what he does, he doesn't fight Wild. Okay, he fights very conservative, he understands where his opponent is, and he uses his technique to slide in and slide out. Very masterful on the feet. Doesn't load up, doesn't use too much energy. Good resume being built by Wilde, as I said at the top, the split decision against Saul Rogers in See, Milan, a draw against Alfie Davis, wins against Leary and Londu. You just saw that footwork by Tim Wilde and him circling, continuing to circle out. You saw Chris trying to chase, and he cannot chase in that direction because he can't get his feet underneath him. That was what we're talking about with Tim Wilde now as a fighter. He fights so smart, beautiful spinning back kick. But that's exactly what I was just talking about with Chris, is that he threw the overhand right, he missed, and then he loaded it back up again and threw it again. He should have followed up with the left hook or maybe just jabbed his way in to close that distance. You can't afford to throw heavy shots like that for three rounds and not get tired. So Chris has got to be a little bit more conservative with the amount of shots he throws, and then don't load up so much. And that right there, when you're looking at Wild, that's a confidence builder. 
That right there is what Chris needs to do. And after talking with Uriah last night, he said he's got to utilize his wrestling in this fight. Yeah, you saw Chris shoot for that double leg. He missed it. Tim Wilde stuffed that. But when it got to that body lock, look at what happens. He's on the ground. But that's a sign of a good wrestler. He shot in on the double, didn't get it, but then he just worked his way up to the body lock, didn't make space, just covered it, and just kind of came out to the body, lift and take down. Boy, you take a look at the shot right there. Chris threw a lot of big right hands, and he didn't land anything flush. You saw Wild being able to block most of them. That's off the top of the head right there a little bit. But it's a matter of once Tim Wild started to figure out the range, his footwork started to create the problems. Nice kick inside. Then he had a beautiful spinning back kick here. Let's see, boom, right to the body. Beautifully placed, well done by Tim Wild. That lands just clean. Very, I was, I very was close a, first round. I was always afraid to throw those because you would nick that elbow at all with your foot. Oh, it hurts. You're limping around the rest of the round. <laughs> I hate to put you both on the spot, but how would you both score that opening round? Because I sense this might be close. We, we don't know, but what I do you think, John? We both agree Tim Wilde. Yeah, Tim, Tim Wilde, yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Just wonder how significant moving forward that takedown at the end of the round was from Gonzalez. Well, what, he wasn't able to do a lot with it because of the timing on it and when it was placed. So if you're Tim, w Tim Wilde, that's the kind of round you want. If you're Chris, you need to take that and bring that takedown somewhere into the first minute and a half. I want to see Chris do more of what he just did with the overhand right, but he's got to follow up with like either an inside leg kick or some sort of left hook, something to come up with it after it. Nice left hand landed to the jaw right there by Tim Wilde. Tim Wilde's being really accurate with those kicks. Be it to the legs or to the body, he's landing and landing with some power. Accurate with hands and feet, isn't he? And he is one of those with cumulative power too. They're really sharp shots. And what also Tim is doing very well is that he's mixing it up. He's jabbing to the body, he's jabbing to the head, and he's coming with the straight right and then kicking inside leg. He's mixing it up so much, it's keeping Chris guessing. Was a big left hook to land it. Tim Wilde landing a beautiful right and then a left hook. He's got Chris take, take a look. Chris starting to stick onto that back foot. Excellent work that from Wilde. One of the most significant moments, if not the most significant of the fight so far. Gonzalez shooting but unsuccessfully. He's criticizing. A bit more than criticizing Tim Wilde's takedown defense beforehand. Gonzalez didn't have much to say about it. What's the range that, that Tim Wilde's using right now? He's using that push kick up the middle, the inside leg kick, all those things is keeping him guessing, so he's not sure when to shoot without getting caught with the knee coming in. And you can see right now Chris is starting to get a little bit to where he's not sure what Tim's going to do. There he comes back with that spinning kick again. Chris is not feeling as comfortable right now. Tim Wilde's got him a little bit off balance. Tim Wilde is so confident on the feet as well. He uses the feints really well, and then actually he got caught. Scoops up underneath the butt. Nice lift and pull away from the fence to the takedown. And a very nice job of staying with that takedown because as soon as he's Tim Wilde was getting to his feet, you saw Chris adjusting his hands, getting him under the butt, like Josh said, going right to that lift. The key to getting that takedown, like John was saying, is you get underneath the butt and you lift a little bit. If you can't get to that position, you go to the body lock like you saw at the end of, first, of the first round. Now Gonzalez looking to do damage, looking to get Wild away from the cage. This is an important position right now because he did get that takedown a little bit later than I, I would have wanted, but he's got time on the clock. So what do you do with the position? Well, John, the game has changed so much since the early days of, you know, of, of MMA. So now, back in the day, we used to put the fighters against the fence to do all the damage and do all the work. Well, now fighters are keen to that. So what they do is they put their back to the fence like Tim is trying to do here. And that's how they kind of wall walk, as we call it, to get back to their feet. So if Chris was looking to have more success, he needs to pull him away from the fence, make him learn to escape from the middle of the cage. Yeah, absolutely. But you're seeing Chris at least go to that point, figure four in the leg, trying to keep it to where... 
half guard position for a Greco-Roman wrestler or any wrestler. That's a beautiful position to be in. Where did you get that from? I don't know. A guy named Randy Couture. Randy Couture. He only put me in it too many times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the wild cord, Nathan Epps desperately trying to tell him what to do here. But John, you and I talk about this all the time. Chris has got to do work here. He can't just afford to hold him from the top because although uh, this is a beautiful takedown, He's got to make sure he's doing damage from there. Otherwise, the strikes on the feet earlier were more significant. A very nice elevator by Tim to get out of that position. Now Wild looking to unload here and do damage. And you got to really be impressed with Wild. Wild's conditioning is just outstanding. He just is an energizer bunny, man. He just keeps on coming at you. That was a beautiful spin kick and a beautiful push kick right up the middle on the bottom of the chin. And then he let the right hand go, and then the left hook landed as well. And Chris is having some problems right now. Tim's doing a good job of not smothering himself either, so his shots are landing clean. He goes straight up the middle, and Wild. Gonzalez starts to look a bit tired, and then... Grabs a hold of Wild. But he's grabbing a hold of Wild and taking him down out of what? Desperation. It's not because he's doing great work. The Wild is the measured one in there. We head to the end of round number two. Early in this round, Tim Wilde came out, landed some clean shots overall. Beautiful left hand landing there. He had that one combination of the right and left that landed cleanly. But Chris Gonzalez said, you know what? We're gonna take this to where I feel comfortable. He took it to the ground. That was a beautiful reshoot on that, getting those hips up off the mat. Wilde got back to his feet. That was clean. It was just a little bit off as far as the placement, as far as his range. But man, he came back after Chris Gonzalez. And in a round that you thought, beautiful front kick. And here's the bottom of my foot. Chris Gonzalez showing toughness in the man. He took some big shots in there and he's hanging tough. Again, the kicking game of Tim Wilde. He has been very effective by landing big shots with those kicks. So heading into the third and final round, how are you scoring that second round, Josh? I think mean, you both agree it's going to be Tim Wilde again. Yeah. I got you Tim two, Wilde winning this two, two, two rounds. You know what? It's very He's, uncommon. No, 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 no. He's learned. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> I'm not going there. Let's watch the fight. Oh. Nice, beautiful low kick by Tim Wilde. But he set that up beautifully with the little feint. He lifted the lead leg, and he came in with the outside leg kick. Wow. Nicely done. Wow, beautifully Look at done. this from Wilde again. Tim Wilde, you see, you know, not only does he go and he stops that takedown, he comes right back at him. That puts a ton of pressure on Chris. And he looks for that jab to the body that could be such an important punch. Come on, back up stairs after that. One, one over the top. Come on, Tim. They're telling Wilde that Gonzalez is tired here. See, he, right there, you saw that switch of the step, and you saw Gonzalez react just off of the step. He was looking for that kick. Look for Tim to start going to the body a little bit to open up more to the head to get him to react and also add in some more feints so he can try to land the kill shot. Looks for that body again. See, but now you're in the position where Tim Wilde is really controlling the range. He's in control of when the engagements occur. Chris is waiting on him. And so this is not the game that Chris Gonzalez is best at. Chris is best when he's the aggressor. At the moment, Wilde's being able to just sit almost on the edge of range and move in and out of it, use that Sir. speed that he's got. When fighters start to take, after they know they, they feel like they've won rounds one and two, and they feel like they sort of take the third round off, what's your take on that, John? I think, man, it's the, it's the worst mistake you can make because what has made you successful to this point is being aggressive and going after him. 
don't change something that's going to give him the possibility of altering the way this fight has progressed. And I'm watching Danny Castillo and Uriah Faber right now, and they're yelling at Chris Gonzalez. You got to move forward. You got to throw. You got to pull right. the trigger. They're so right, and, it, and it, it's easy to say, and we say it all the time. Not as easy to do when you got a guy like Wild who's landing great shots on you and and being able to control that distance. Wild just dug into that left to the body. Gonzalez then blocked the left hook, and Wild's never lost the decision. He is in some very very close fights. Tim Wild just looks phenomenal, though. In the first two rounds, just picking them apart, able to touch, touch, not really loading up, letting everything just go and flow. And that's how you should fight. And oh, the knockouts will present themselves. Absolutely. You know, and you, you could take you know, right now as, he, as he's looking. He, he, he hits that spin kick beautifully well. I mean, as far as his, his the way he sets it up, his footwork on it, he doesn't really give that tell right off the beginning. So it's not an easy thing to deal with. Even had time there to put his finger to his lips to quieten down the Gonzalez corner. Sign of a man with a great deal of confidence. Doesn't want to get overconfident. With a minute 40 left, what are you looking for Chris to do more of? In my opinion, Chris needs to really put it in his head. I've got to go forward and take steps towards setting up my right hand. Right now, if you if you take a look at Tim Wilde and where he's at, Chris has now switched to a southpaw. But when Chris is in this orthodox position right here, he's not able to get it to where Tim's moving in the direction of his right hand. When wrestlers switch to their southpaw stance, that usually means they're going to try to wrestle a little bit more because most wrestlers are a right leg lead. Yeah. So far, it's gone perfectly, just about perfectly for Tim Wilde. Gonzalez needs something dramatic here. Wild looking for those elbows from that bottom position. He's in one of those... against Gonzalez now, Josh. Yeah, he's in one of those do or die positions, John, where he's got to really kind of either press him to the fence, posture up, pinch the knees together so he can't move. So Tim Wild can't move, then he can posture up and let, let go of the vicious ground and pound. Yeah, and the biggest problem is Wild right now, you see him with the underhook on the arm and stuff. He's kind of keeping him close. He's using that for to control the posture and stuff. Chris isn't able to get enough space to land that big shot. There you go. The key to doing this is forearm across the throat, posturing the head up, and then coming over the top with, the other, with the other punch. Ten seconds remaining, though. Gonzalez, go. look for that big shot. Is it too little, too late from Chris Gonzalez? It certainly feels that way. It certainly is that way. Largely a command performance from Tim Wilde, full of feints and movement and quality and sharp work. Really good decision making as well, and and it was dominant. It's up there with career best that for for Tim Wilde. It was excellent, John. I thought it was an outstanding performance by Tim Wilde. But I, I'm going to really say, I thought it was a very good performance by Chris Gonzalez. Also, he needs that kind of fight where he fights through those situations, and he was fighting through it to the end. I don't think he got the win, but in my opinion, there's really no loser in that type of fight. Chris Gonzalez is it. Chris Gonzalez is extremely tough. Beautiful straight right right there as Atlanta. It kind of just knocked him off balance. Yeah, it was sat, off sat balance. Tim Wilde to his butt. They kind of touched gloves to acknowledge that. But then, you know, Chris needed to kind of try to follow up on that scenario. Absolutely. The fatigue in the third round sets in. You don't, you know, your, your reactions aren't as fast. Yeah. But, I mean, you see, like, Tim Wilde was just able to land the straighter punches. He was getting to the target a lot faster than Chris was because Chris was loading up and throwing the overhand rights, whereas Tim Wilde was throwing everything straight. Yep. Well, just time for Michael to grab hold of those cards and collect the necessary information. And then we will have a decision. See Leon Edwards in the Tim Wilde corner. Very, very uh, strong team, a team renegade. Proud of their fighters, all of them get behind all of them. And of course, they've got Fabian Edwards in the, uh, the big one tonight. But this will be a big boost if Tim Wilde gets it for the team. Michael C. Williams is ready. Let's get up to him now for the decision.
Ladies and gentlemen, your decision from your case side judges, your first Eric Cologne, 29 to 28. Well, judges Brian Miner and Ben Cartledge both see it the same, 30, 27. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Tim Wild. Massive win that, big performance too from Tim Wild. What a night for him. Great to have Josh with us. He will be returning. Of course, he'll be with Amanda as well. But fantastic to have Josh in commentary as we watch another lightweight celebrate here. Tim Wilder, he's getting the cheers of this uh, arena too. That was outstanding, and he's thrilled with it. And as John said, Chris Gonzalez, of course, will learn plenty and will come again. But talking of lightweights, we've got a very, very special night tonight, of course, in the lightweight Grand Prix. <laughs> World Grand Prix is underway. But... Alexander Shockley, but just not enough offensive output, and now Messiah has been stopped by a shot below the belt. You had a fair blow land on the body, and then there was what we would call incidental contact with the foot coming down, touching the groin. Jason Herzog is telling Messiah, look, if you can't continue on, you gotta let me know, but you're gonna lose. And it's over. It's a TKO victory for Alexander Schaub. Oh, you're in a bad look here. Look at that kick! Usman Nurmagomedov just kicked Benson Henderson. And this may be the coup de grace for Usman Nurmagomedov. Yeah. Usman Nurmagomedov vanquishes Benson Henderson and does it in quick fashion to retain the Bellator lightweight belt and move on in the $1 million World Grand Prix. So come on then, John. Here's the uh, lightweight World Grand Prix bracket. We're going to... Look at bottom left. That's what's going to be decided we're tonight. We're going to look at that a lot tonight. We're going to look at that a lot. But let, let, let's look at all of it, shall we? Let's go crazy and go top right, bottom right, wherever you want. Man, I'll tell you what. The fight we have tonight is fantastic. That fight with Primus and Barnaby, they match up so well. Primus being a former champion, Barnaby being a champion in other divisions, other promotions now coming to Bellator because he wants to fight that guy above him, Nurmagomedov. But... AJ McKee against Pitbull. That's going to be fantastic. And the winner of that has to face a sniper in Alexander Shabley. There is no easy road to this getting the win as the World Grand Prix champion. I think no easy roads at understatement. <laughs> Astonishingly difficult. Well, the fight is in the cage. What a shot that is. What a picture that is of the Accor Arena tonight. And just how excited these fight fans are. Some more excitement now. The undefeated Savayan Hamidov heads for the Bellator cage for the second time. Takes on another experienced fighter, this time in the shape of the local man, Kevin Pecci. They prepare to do battle at a contracted weight of 141 pounds. Well, the tail of the tape at a contracted weight of 141 pounds is Kevin Pecci and Savayan Hamidov prepared to go head to head. And John, you obviously want to take a look at those records because that's outstanding from this talked about young fighter. Yeah, you're talking 18 and 5 for Pecci. That's a great record, but 14 and 0. Has never tasted defeat for Hamidov. Can he continue on? We will find out. Let's head to Michael C. Williams. For all those that may just be joining us here at Bellator 296, we welcome you to the prelims here in Paris as we go okay. now to three five-minute rounds at a contract weight of 141 pounds. Introducing first the blue corner at five foot nine, weighing in 140.4 pounds tonight. In his Bellator debut, he enters with 18 professional victories, five defeats, fighting out of Saffron France. Presenting Kevin the Machine Gun Pecci.
And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot six, weighing in 140.6 pounds. His professional record undefeated, 14 wins, no losses. Out of the Dushombe, Tajikistan, introducing Cyberjohn Mowgli Almiro. In charge, your referee Blake Grice. So Kamidov won six consecutive fights by a decision before that round one KO of Jose Marino Tome in Milan last time. He said he was disappointed that it was over so soon. He'd been working hard and wanted to show us some more, but he is a very, very exciting talent with, as you said, uh, an outstanding record already. Well, Mowgli did not get a warm welcome here. <laughs> That's, the fans going with Petchy, that is their hometown guy. Don't blame him. But he's definitely got it a tough fight against a guy who is very good with his wrestling, his striking. He is very hard to predict what he's going to do. He will take somebody down and let them ride up. He just has his own style, but man, he is effective. Petchy, a training partner at the Atch Academy run by Stefan Chaufourier of uh, Fabakahi Giata. Here in numbers tonight. Doing great work there. Petchy is a very good fighter. You watch him in his fights and he, he controls distance very well. He's fast. So one thing that we, as you watch him, you know, you keep on watching things he does, you go, man, he's fast, he's fast. And he uses that speed well. You saw him get caught up in that takedown. This is what Hamadoff does. He is so good at the takedowns, but he'll let you up. He likes to use his ground and pound. And then all of a sudden he'll decide, ah, I'm done. Let's get back to our feet. Got it in a great position as well, right in the center of the cage. From Tajikistan says he wants to use his skills to tell the world about his country, about its beauty and its people. Well, this is the, this is the part that I really like about Hamadov when you watch him is he will not just sit there and hold and control. He will always be looking to do damage because he doesn't care if the fight ends up going back to the feet. He's comfortable there and he'll look for another takedown when he wants. So he's always looking to do damage. He's always looking to land the big strike, the big elbow. Just trying to work that position where he can do that damage here. He has definitely clamped down on that left leg of Pecci. As you say, John, it's perpetual motion from him, isn't it? He's just looking to find a way to get that damage done, keeping Pecci under pressure. And you see Pecci moving. From, he's, he's doing a lot of good work here now in Butterfly. With his guard, he's really trying to do all kinds of things. But again, when you're looking at Hamadov, he doesn't care what position he's in. He, he likes being in guard. He'll take half guard. He'll go to side control. He'll stand up. He's just a motion machine. Mowgli the motion machine. There you go. We, we just came up with something. <laughs> Not necessarily something that's got legs, but hey -ho, <laughs> that's the next step. All right. Nice job of stepping into that half guard there. You saw Pecci looking for that elevator sweep. Hamanov used that to get to the half guard, now landing big shots. Seven wins inside the distance for Hamidov. He said he's ready to go all three here, but expected to finish Pecci early. Did the, did the referee say he needs some action? Let's go. What, what is he looking at? <laughs> Those guys are going. Well, I think it sparked Hamidov anyway. 
We're going to see a bit more action now. Pecci unable to figure out a way to get Hamadov up. So he, Blake Grice, the referee, decides, I'll do it for you. <laughs> Looks to land that flying knee. Pecci straight away gets the crowd interested again. So round number two, Kevin Pecci and cheered on here by this French crowd against Savayan Hamidov. Dominant round from Hamidov in uh, round one and he looks to get Pecci back into that same position but I think this time he's going to work and work and make sure the referee knows that's what he's doing. <laughs> you know, he's working right now. And Pecci did a nice job of trying to get himself up from that position but he was allowing Hamidov to take the back he's trying to get himself back to where his back is not exposed but that leg being trapped there that's not a comfortable position to be in if you are petchy because you're really trapped to using one leg here in this situation nice job by petchy to get back petchy does have nine wins by submission a great variety as well i think this is it's a game of levels, isn't it? And that's uh, what tonight's all about. Well, the, the big level difference that we're seeing between the two fighters right now is Hamadov's wrestling is the, that's the factor that Pecci right now can't stop. Every time that Hamadov goes for that takedown, he's able to achieve it. The discussions about the weight, Hamadov said that Pecci's team wanted it at a, a contract weight. <laughs> to be honest, he said, we didn't really care, we took it anyway, whatever the conditions, we're confident. So far that's being borne out here. And she's won five of his last six. Again, goes back to that point about levels. One of his five defeats was against Paddy Pimblett. You might have heard of him in Bolton eight years ago. He's travelled uh, a fair bit. Also lost against Robert Whiteford. Uh, again, a good while ago, just after that Pimblett fight. you really have no answer for getting Hamadov out of the position. He can lose as far as he ends up, you know, allowing him to get to half guard or anything, but he can't get himself up, can't get that sweep, can't get back to his feet. And so he's stuck with his guard right now. And at this point, he hasn't been able to throw up any kind of submission attack to try to slow down Hamadov. See, and all that's good movement right there. That, you know, he's trying to switch his hips. He's trying to change the angle on here. He just physically isn't able to get Hamadov out from the balance point that he's got, squaring up and then landing shots. 
Hanadol's not just technically excellent, but so physically strong as well, and he's in great shape, isn't he? Yep. Uh, you, you cannot go with the intensity that he's gone with throughout this fight so far. Like I said, you know, I know the referee has said, you know, action and stuff. That's all they've done, both. And Hamanov has been the one in charge of it. He's the one that's pushing that pace. So, great conditioning. Pepecci, it's that constant battle to not just get to his feet, but to not be a target. To not allow Hamidov to start unloading, because that is the beginning of the end. See, and right there, Pecci went for that elevator sleep, st sweep. Excuse me. He tried to get that inside, and you saw Hamidov stop the sweep and then slip the leg by, getting into half guard, making things just a little bit worth, worse for Pecci. Elevator sleep is what you do when you're waiting for the elevator in our hotel, but that's Thank a different story. <laughs> So far, the very definition of dominant. Both rounds, very similar. See right there, Pecci tried to throw up to try to move that position to get into a submission. Past the legs, now inside control. Back to half guard on the other side. Pecci hasn't been able to throw up any true catch attack or anything that could get a submission. So the third and final round of what has been a completely dominant performance so far from Savion Hamidov. And he's not breathing particularly deeply, as you were just pointing out, between rounds to me, John. No, I'm, I'm disgusted by that. <laughs> he's, he's put out all that. The same thing with Pesci, though. Both guys in great, great condition. Really putting out a lot of energy here, but, man, both guys able to stay with that pace. It's the desperate and again take down defense from Pecci. It's the wrestling is the difference. Pecci has not been able to stop Hamanov on any of the wrestling. Hamanov able to take him down at will. Nice job by Pecci. Trying not to give the back. That's what Hamidov's looking for. Maybe to stop the intensity. Maybe sensing that Pecci's starting to fade. He's got both the hooks in now, and he's trying to flat him out. Pesci doing a nice job controlling the one hand, but he's stuck in that position right now. And it's at this moment now where all of that pressure in the opening couple of rounds starts to build. He's on the figure four on the body. Now he's after that neck. See if he's able to get it. That's on. He's got it. He does get the stoppage. The rear naked does for Kevin Pecci. And that was just dominance. And eventually, Pecci crumbled. But 
anyone would have done. He was under so much pressure all the way through. Yeah, you have to look and say that was a, a win through attrition because he just kept on putting him in bad positions, making him work his way out. All kinds of pressure, all kinds of shots. Eventually, you wear it down and you make more mistakes, and that's what happened right there. The wrestling was the biggest difference. Pecci was not able to stop Hamadoff in wrestling at any time. Well, he's a scary prospect, isn't he? He moves to 15 and 0, and that is going to be some journey to watch, I reckon. Right here is a takedown. He gets the body lock. You see him turn him to the side. And right away, looks towards taking the back. You see him trying to get the hooks. Pecci tries to fight that off, and he did a very nice job of defending throughout most of that fight. But then it got to this. Once he got that figure four body lock on, he was able to get into that palm to palm on the rear naked choke. Beautiful submission. 15 and 0 for Hamadov, man. He is showing that he is someone to deal with when it comes to basically the Bantamweight division, he is a monster. Absolutely, we can make it official now with Michael C. Williams. Inside the Bellator cage, the rear naked choke brings on the tap. Official time, one minute, 33 seconds into round number three by submission. The winner still undefeated, Sarvajon Mogli People are starting to sit up and take notice of Mowgli. Outstanding display from Hamidov. Of course, much more to come from us here tonight. For now, though, we return. Josh is back with Amanda. He is. We decided we would do some work. We decided to go cage side and watch a couple fights here. Uh, but now we are back in our positions, which our producer is very happy about. So let's talk about what we have coming up tonight. Uh, we are here inside the Accor Arena. It is a sold out crowd tonight. We're still almost two hours away from the main card starting. And this place is nearly full. This is an incredible video. It's rocking in here. And the music they play it gets the crowd hyped. And the crowd is just going crazy. And they're loving all this, obviously, all the French fighters. Yeah, just don't dance, OK? Because that's <laughs> That's not ideal. Uh, okay, really okay, quickly, okay, we're going to get into the first fight of the night, but our main event tonight is absolutely yes. incredible. Gegard Mousasi going up against Fabian Edwards. The winner gets to fight Johnny Eblen. We'll get to that in a second. But here is the first fight of the night. Kane Musa going up against Thibaut Guti. Now, Kane Musa, his last fight against Georgie Karahanian, somebody with 31 wins, he won that fight. So, Josh, I felt like that was my coming out party. I said, okay, if you win tonight, what is that? He goes, it is confirmation. But Timo Guti, he's got a ton of talent. Yeah, with Kane Musa, what it was, the confirmation was he believed in his cardio, he believed in his new camp, he believed in all the things that he was doing in training. In that fight against Carl he ripped the body, came back up top to the head. He looked fantastic. But Timo Guti is someone who is a technician. He will bring the action, he will walk you down, he'll utilize his jab as inside kicks. Kane Musa will tend to have problems with people who utilize a lot of kicks. Amanda, yeah, it's always worth watching Yves Londu make his way to the cage. He is some character, former breakdancer. Do you ever stop being a breakdancer? Well, we'll find out. No, you do not. I'm going to sit back and let him take over here. He took care of a really good fighter in Gavin Hughes in the first round here last year. Then he gave us one of the great post-fight celebrations. And you can see why they love him. You have to smile when you remember that he grew up as a, what he describes as an active child in the suburbs of Paris, and he took up MMA initially to take up some of his energy. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, it's one of the things about Yves that do it. 
he is stepping down in weight to 145 from being a lightweight. And I always said he was such a small lightweight. He was winning fights, but he was incredibly small compared to his opponents. I think this is a great move going to 145. The tail of the tape at a contract weight of 147 pounds as Piotr Nijelski, late replacement, takes on Yves Landu. And John, you've decided to focus on that reach. Well, it's because Landu uses his length so well, and normally that 73 is close to what his opponent is. This is the first time I've ever seen him with that advantage. We're going to see what he can do with it. Let's head now to Michael C. Williams. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here at Bellator 296, the prelims continue on with three five-minute rounds at 147 pounds. And now, first, introducing the blue corner at five foot nine, weighing in 146.2 pounds. His professional record: 17 wins, five losses. On a post non Poland, Piotr Nielsenko, Nielsenski. And across the cage, his adversary, fighting out of the red corner at five foot eight, weighing in 145.8 pounds, having one, two straight. Now, inside the Bellator cage, he stands with 18 professional victories, nine defeats. He fights out of Paris, France, presenting Eve Yonor. in charge Blake Grice well we talked a lot about Eve Londu roared in here by this capacity crowd the pantomime booze for his opponent Piotr Nijelski Nijelski in this cage beat Pedro Carvalho last year and then just in a bizarre performance in a strange fight lost against Richie Schmullen and no disrespect to Richie who took his chance, but Nijelski just made a series of series bad of decisions, didn't there you he? Go. I know he's a fighter you like, John Nijelski. Uh, he's a very good fighter. In fact, I looked at, you know, this. he was a last-minute replacement for Landu here, and I thought, man, they just put the, a whole lot more difficult fight in front of Landu coming to 145, but Landu had no problem taking it, so... Jelski is very good in the stand-up. He's good on the ground. He's going to match up really well with Landu, and he is technically very sharp. He's on a run of nine wins in a row before that Smullen fight. Got carried away. Remember, he looked for a guillotine, and he looked for it for a long time, and whether it tired him, it was a, said it was a curious display. And it was, well, you know, Richie Smolin is, is a specialist. And they, he's a ground specialist. On the feet, he's always looking to get the fight to the ground. And he did, but he did it off of things that Nijelski was the one to bring it there. And you go, why are you going into that man's world like that? He thought he could get the submission. It didn't work out for him. Just having a look at each other here. We've got this fight at nine days' notice. Nijelski, but he's one of those fighters who keeps himself in terrific shape. No real problem with that. Already this feels like a better game plan from Nijelski. Nijelski has landed a very clean calf kick, now goes a little bit higher on it, but just nice, clean attacks, not overextending. Landu looking for the big shot. Landu needs to just get back into just being a guy whose volume plays. He's got power. He is physically strong. All that break dancing, everything he does, spinning on one hand. Trust me, he's strong. He's got power. He just needs to touch. Five wins by knockout for Landu. Eight by a decision. Might be in this for the long haul, but. They're both going to start unloading soon. Nijelski with the better work early on, but Londu now may be looking to land.
problem is when you come in as that bundle of energy, the crowd wants it all the time. They want that constant entertainment, and Landu can't fall into that trap. Uh, well, and that's exactly it. Landu has been known for his last couple of fights, getting the, the stoppage, getting the big knockout and everything. You can't just expect to do that against good fighters. You got to break a good fighter down. That was a nice body shot by Ninjelski. And then Duke getting on his bike because of it. Good boxing work from Nijelski and use as well of those leg kicks. It was the boxing that won him the fight against Carvalho. Really good striking, really good foot movement. Good block there, Londu tried to land the overhand right. Very compact, isn't he, out of that southpaw stance, yeah. Nijelski. Use that long left hand. Jelski has been able to land the better shots throughout this round, though. And just having, a, having some difficulty in figuring out his timing of when he can enter. And right there, that just tells you Nijelski wants this fight on the feet. Not getting back into that Richie Smolin moment. <laughs> He's learned his lesson, I think, John. Yeah. It only takes one. There's a kick from Nijelski, and again, he just moves himself out of danger. One thing I would say about the Richie Spallon fight is for all that went wrong, Nijelski still thought he won, and it was close. It was close. Nijelski doing a really nice job on Landu's right leg when he brings himself into that southpaw stance. Nijelski's been eating that leg up. So round number two, not for Nijelski, looking slick and more effective in that opening round. Oh, good left hand though from Long Dude, lands for the Let's first go, time. Landed it again and then missed with the right, but here he comes, Yves Long Dude. Don't get too wild. He needs to just, just keep on touching him. Control that space right now. Nijelski getting his legs back, feeling a little bit better. He definitely got stung. He gave Landu so much encouragement, though. Landu needs to get back to being the guy who's going forward. He cannot have Nijelski controlling that range by pushing him back. He doesn't want to be on his back foot. He was buzzed by that strike. Nijelski's head is cleared. Landu. Launches another, didn't miss by much. Landu, like most fighters, is better at going forward than going back. Not a lot of fighters can go back and be successful with their striking. to that left hand, Nijelski.
Better this though from Londu. You'd still want more volume from him, wouldn't you? I do, I do want to see a little more volume out of him, but I like the fact that he's going forward. This right here is fine. You can be in that little bit where you're both controlling that space, but every time you see him when he started to do this, that is not the way he can fight well. He does not want to be on that back foot. Interesting to see Nijelski just getting back to those leg kicks as well there, realizing the damage it's doing. Left hand from Nijelski was a good sharp shot. That was a, that was a clean shot. Uses those feints well. The pole, Nijelski. Huge haymaker there of a left hand. He does have a couple of wins, but body kicks Nijelski. Does have the arsenal. sense that this second round is still up for grabs and might be absolutely pivotal both guys getting a little head hunt happy need to go to the body a little bit more that's going to help bring the hands down they're bringing the kicks to the legs but all the punching is up top Feels like Londu has missed a lot so far. I know he's landed a couple of times, yeah. but those little moments can use up energy as well. Crowd are trying to get behind him here. Yeah. Looking for that level change. Very nice job by Nijelski. High head in that position is usually going to win it. You saw Landu's head was down. Nijelski was able to keep get his head up high. That's why he was able to get out of the position. See the damage now on that lead leg. Lead leg from the southpaw stance yep. of Londu, the right leg. Joski landed that last kick for the first time. You could really see the effect it had on Yves Londu. Well, Joski's busted up his shin. You can see that his shin is split. So he's bleeding, going down the shin onto his foot. You're going to see that blood transfer over if he continues to kick. Attacking the other leg there, Nijelski. Closing 10 seconds of round number two. Interesting to hear how John scoring this at the end of uh, this second round. Good round overall. I take a look at that, and you got to remember in the beginning, Landu hurt Nijelski. Nijelski had a little bit better at the end of that round, but not enough to overcome what Landu had landed and the fact that he got hurt there. I think we have an even fight going into the third round. Take a look right here. That was the big left hand by Yves Landu that landed Hurt him, he landed another one. You saw Nijelski having to get distance. Nijelski did a good job of coming back off of it. That was that left hand again. You see it stung him, loses his balance, trying to get his legs underneath him. A couple more shots landed off of it. And then Landu looking for the takedown here. Able to get it to the ground, but not enough to maintain and control it as a takedown. But overall, I thought he did enough to get that round. It should be 1-1. Seven of Yves Londu's nine defeats have come by a decision. Nijelski, six and four when it's gone the distance. Might be in that territory here. But they are both explosive. Success there for Londu, and he followed it up well. Is this Yves Londu's moment? 
Ladu did not land a shot that hurt Nijelski, but it put him off balance. And that's why we're in the position we're at. Let's see if Landu can take this and create a situation where he's able to do some damage here. He's got a Kimura grip on that arm. Nice job looking for it. Love the fact that he's going for it. Looking for that arm bar. Jelski trying to fight his way out. Still there, but he's got to extend those hips. Jelski trying to fight through that, control the arm, he's out. Well done by Nijelski. Mundu tried to jump on the opportunity there. Yeah, in my opinion, you really have to have that arm bar set to really go for it. You gotta know that I have this where I have it. When I swing around, it's gonna be deep. It's gonna be difficult for them to try to swing themselves out of it, turn over. But I love the fact that Landu went for it. And that moment's given him confidence. He gets back to the feet, lands a right hand, and then looks to land another in the swinging left. I wonder if Nijelski's just maybe feeling it a bit here. Maybe yeah. the fact he was a late replacement. Yeah, that's true. You got to look and say, you know, he took this. Could he be getting a little bit tired? Landu, I think, senses that as well. Nijelski, for the first time in the fight, on the back foot here. Yeah, Nijelski right there got hit with another shot. You see him looking for the takedown. Try and do something with this position, Nijelski. Nijelski right now just holding, you see. He's just trying to control the position. Nandu needs to continue to just hit with all those little strikes, elbows and work towards either looking for the submission, look for the reversal, or get back to your feet. But don't stay on your back. That would been an important moment in the fight that Nijelski takedown, because Londu was starting to take over on the feet. trying to just maneuver himself out here. Really, all you have right now, Landu, is doing the work from underneath, trying to extend Nijelski out away from him. Nijelski just keeps on following the hips of Landu, but Landu needs to, he needs to get more into, I've got to get out of here. Don't accept this position. Figure out if you don't get out of here, there's a good possibility you're going to lose this fight. So I got to get back to my feet, which is what he's doing right now. He's up. What can he do with it? Spinning attack there from Londu. That was really smart. He's got to get to work now. for something flashy and dramatic crowd please it as always well we see that all the time from him and now's the time to start pulling it out you know come up with something big go after the flying knee he's we've seen him win with flying knees he's knocked out really good fighters so he's got that ability Londu lands again if he can even finish with a flourish here it might be enough he decides to take Nijelski down 15 seconds remain It's going to be tight, this. They go the distance, and now this crowd will wait nervously for the decision. How did you score it? I have it for Landu. I thought, you know, Nijelski won the first round. I thought that Landu won the second. Now, take a look at that one, and if you recall, Landu landed a couple of shots in the beginning. It, not that they really hurt. 
Nijelski, but Nijelski didn't have that big moment. When he was in the top position, he got the takedown. He was controlling. He wasn't fighting. He, you're controlling and letting the clock burn. At least Landu was looking to do something to try to win the fight. Nijelski is feeling it. You can see that was a very, very tired fighter. Let's say, by the way, very impressive performance as a late replacement, but let's see some of that action from the third round. Absolutely, you know, right there, there was the knockdown and stuff, but it wasn't that Nijelski got hurt. It was a foot got crossed up, off balance there. Landu goes after him. Went for the arm bar. I love the fact that he went for that. Tried to put him in danger, never had it really extended out to where he was in danger. Nijelski did a nice job of coming back on that, got his arm free. But that's the look of a fighter trying to finish the fight. When we saw Nijelski in the top position, more holding, and that's the difference maker right there. It was a good fight by both men. I'm just gonna go with the guy that I looked at who was trying to finish the fight. It is one of those, though, everyone will have their opinion. Many of them will be legitimate, pointing in different yeah, directions. Yeah. It'll be discussed, I'm sure. We will see if this crowd will get what they want, though. Let's get up to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your three judges, Eric Colon, Sal, the model, Chris Lee, all have it the same. 29 to 28 for the winner by unanimous decision, Eva Yanou So Landu gets it, and are we going to see the celebration now? Let's just wait and see if Eve Landu gives them what they want. Nijelski looks stunned by that. Shouldn't be. You allow that fight to be close like that. You have your moments, you can attack. Well, I don't think he is gonna give Josh a dancing lesson here. At least we're not gonna see it for now. But let's get back to Amanda and Josh. Hey, we saw a little flare in the cage. We like to see that. Amanda Gara, Josh Thompson here with you. Let's talk about our second fight we have coming up tonight. Douglas Lima going up against Costello Vancinas. Look, Douglas Lima, three-time world champion welterweight. He says, done with that. I want to eat bread and cheese. I'm in Paris, right? Kidding. That's not why he moved up to middleweight. But he has the extra 15 pounds. Talk to us about that, how he feels more comfortable and some of the brutal leg kicks that he can deliver. The extra 15 pounds can to give you the confidence that you're not going to get fatigued later on in the fight. I mean, that's what was happening to him when he was at welterweight. He would tend to slow down as the fight went on. But what he brought in the welterweight division for so many years, he was the pillar of this organization and definitely of the welterweight division. It's the leg kicks, the power. You saw him deliver that that sat MVP to his butt. MVP got up the wrong way, and boom, lights out with the power. And I love this song behind us, by the way. But Douglas <laughs> Lima just brings it. He did it to Rory McDonald several times in that fight when they fought twice. Oh. In that fight, you look at the damage he could commit with just a couple leg kicks. If he gets started early and often with the leg kicks to Vancinas, that will slow Vancinas down a lot. What is this song? What is this song? Can you hear me? You can yeah, barely can hear me because it's so loud. It's so loud. Okay, talk to me about Costello Vancinas. I mean, you've talked about his personality in the cage. He has a mean streak. He can be a little wild at times. Where is he technically so sound? So technically, he's good everywhere, but I really like what he's making his adjustments over the years that he's been away. He's really worked on his grappling. And what I mean by that is that he pushes the pace to the fence. When he gets him to the fence, he does work. And what I mean by does work is he gets busy with the elbows, he gets busy with the knees, and he makes his opponent start to wilt. And as they start to wilt, he starts to adjust, hits in the darts, gets in the front chokes. As he starts attacking, he looks for the finishes. Look, if, if you're a fan at home, you're looking for fighters, or you want to support fighters that are always looking to finish the fight, like Big John was just talking about with Landu. That's what you're looking for. He looks to try to finish every single time he's in that cage. He wants to put on an entertaining show. He said, I want to be the first person to finish Douglas Lima in more than 15 years. Dave, Big John, I think Josh, I, it's not the music. He's just hard of hearing, y'all. <laughs> 
It's great. Loving your energy. Absolutely loving it. The immensely popular Davy Gallon will be roared on now as he gets this crowd going and looks to get back in the winning habit against Saul Rogers. The tail of the tape then at lightweight. Saul Rogers and Davy Gallon get it on. John, you picked out the key area again of those records. Yeah, it's because of a lot of experience on both. It looks like Davy has more fights, but Sal Rogers done a lot of exhibitions too. This is a great matchup. Charisma bursting out of the cage, including Michael C. Williams. Tonight here at Accor Arena, we'll move right to three five-minute rounds in the lightweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at five foot ten, weighing in 155.8 pounds. His professional record: 15 wins, five losses. Fighting out of Deerfield Beach, Florida, USA, by way of Manchester, England. Saul the Hangman Rogers. And across the cage is adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot eight, weighing in 155.4 pounds. The veteran professional brings 21 victories, eight defeats, two draws. He fights out of Normandy, France, introducing Davy Lenormand. And your referee in charge, Jacob Montalvo. You could see Saul Rogers embracing the booze. <laughs> Why not thrive off them? Gallon is hugely popular. Le Normand from Normandy. And he uh, is trying to bounce back from that defeat against Daniele Scatizzi, which was something of a surprise in Milan. Saul Rogers lost a split against Tim Wilde. We're okay to carry on. Sal Rogers is one of the strongest guys you will ever see in the cage physically. At 145, it was crazy, but he was losing too much weight to have enough to maintain it. At 155, this is a perfect weight for him. Gallon hits like a truck in the stand-up. He's got great judo. Can he put one of those shots on Sal Rogers' chin? That's the that's the key before this is what happens because Rogers when he gets into the ground and pound can be devastating. This is what Rogers wanted. It's a nightmare start for David Gallon. Beautiful return to the mat. You saw Gallon starting to get himself back up. Rogers right back to oh yeah. Let me just take you right back down. Good job of lacing the arm now. That's keeping him flat on his side right there. Very nicely done by Sal Rogers. And one of the things that everybody that I've ever had in a fight with, Sal Rogers came out saying, oh my God, that is the strongest dude I have ever fought. And you, and you will find those guys. And here he goes jumping onto that, looking for that guillotine. Looking for it already here, Rogers. What a start this is. This is part of why they call him the hangman. He loves this right here. And the fact that he's in that position, you see Davy using his leg to try to create space there. That is not a comfortable position. He's trying to use that leg to push his arm out away from his carotid artery. See there, the it pressure might... on Galon. He might have it here. It. He's got it. Oh, no. no, 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 no. Made a mistake. Made a mistake. No. They misread it. Like, Everyone makes mistakes, I suppose, John. I understand, but you saw the defense of David Gallon and what he was doing. It, and that's a that's a proper defense for what was being done. And he's trying to create that space. And you got to look at it's called what I say. Look at the look at the macro. Don't look at the micro. Don't look towards just his face. You got to look at his body response. And his body was still tense. That's telling you he's still there. Saul Rogers, in his defense, is saying, Saul Rogers what am I did supposed to do? Yeah. wrong. Saul Rogers went in there, did exactly what he was supposed to do. That's try to put that type of submission on him. It just wasn't read right by the referee. Look at this is not a. When you watch this, you're going to see Jacob Montalvo, the referee, is a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He knows submission. 
it can happen to anybody. This is, you're trying to make sure that you're protecting the fighter. And right now, when you're looking at that face, sometimes that's what we'll do is we'll start to focus on the face instead of looking at the whole body. And you see how the face starts to get covered here. So it becomes more difficult. And what he's looking at is that position when he starts to drop down, but he's still tight. You can see it. That's why he tried to shake, but that defense was the correct defense and it was working for him. It's it's just, it's a mistake. It's, it's too bad. They should put him back together for another fight. Well, that's your instant thought, isn't it? It is. Rematch it. You know, and I feel bad for David Gallon. I feel bad for Saul Rogers because he had a true chance of possibly making that work. Well, we'll never know on this occasion, but let's make that unsatisfactory ending official with Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage with the Darce choke in tight, it comes to an end. Two minutes, 12 seconds, round number one, the winner by submission, Saul the Hanghead Rogers. So it is a win. For yeah. Saul Rogers, you feel for everyone really yeah. involved in all of that. Let's uh, get up to you now, uh, Amanda and Josh. Very, very disappointing, that. Yeah, absolutely, Josh. I'm just going to let you take this one. Uh, just unfortunate ending there. That was a great toss, by the way. I'm You're welcome. You take it. <laughs> That's how uh, we do it. Look, the referee's job is, like John said, is for the fighter's safety. And he wanted to make sure that it wasn't held on too long. Uh, it was the true defense to it. Uh, it just, it's an unfortunate situation. I agree with John, and I agree with Dave, and I think they should put that fight back together. Hopefully, we see that again soon. Hopefully we will. A lot to come here still in the prelims. But tonight on the main card, the lightweight World Grand Prix, that continues. And this one is going to be incredible. Brent Primus going up against Mansoor Banawi. The winner of this gets to face off against Usman Nurmagomedov, the current champ. So not only are they on the road to a million dollars, but the title fight is next. Josh, let's start with Brent Primus and this one, former champ here. He said, I trained harder for this camp than I ever have. I took it so seriously when we talked to him, Big John and you went back and forth. Did he overtrain or not? He did something called the five-round shark tank last Saturday. Explain what that is, and did he potentially overtrain for well, this Well, Big fight? John thought because it happened so soon, so close to the fight, I said, yeah, but what happens is you dial down your training. So I'm not going to say that he overtrained, but talking with Brent, he's like, look, I normally do overtrain. So I understand where Big John's coming. But when I look at when I look at what Brent Primus needs to get done tonight against um, Monster Barnaby is he needs to push the pace. He needs to make sure that Barnaby doesn't get comfortable in there. And what Brent Primus does very well is he stalks after you. He lets the leg kicks go. He's got really heavy hands. And when he's able to press you to the fence, he's able to scoop and lift. He is a physically strong fighter. And when he gets his hands locked, you are going for a ride. And when he gets to that top position, he can really let the submissions go. Kimuras, guillotines, if he works to your back, look for him to get that finish on the rear naked choke. Really quickly, what is a five-round shark tank? So five-round shark tank, what it is, you get a new person every two and a half minutes for five rounds or one person every five minutes for five rounds. Sounds absolutely delightful. When it comes to Mansoor Barner, we look at his nickname. His name is the Afro Samurai. I think he should be the silent assassin. He doesn't talk at all. He's very, very private. Why is he so deadly in the cage, though? He's just nasty good. In the clinch, he's able to work his way to takedowns and when he gets to that top position he's able to do work he fought one of my old teammates out of piccolotti and when he did was so impressed he was able to push the elbow across get to the back and when he wiggled his way to the back he went right to the uh rear naked choke wasn't able to get that went palm to palm and got the finish nicely done out of piccolotti is one of the best grapplers in the game and he made it look easy dave we'll send it back down to you Thanks very much indeed, guys. Fascinating to hear Josh's analysis there and also sharing the opinion about the rogers on rematch. Let's hope we can do that soon. I know a lot of people inside the sport are really excited about our next fight. Two great technicians, two brilliant practitioners head-to-head -head here. Luca Pockley taking on Oliver and Camp. Both would seem to have multiple routes to victory here. The tail of the tape at welterweight. Oliver Enkamp and Luca Pockley face each other in the Bellator cage. John, you've looked at that reach. Yeah, Enkamp with a 76.5 karate stance. Very difficult to get to, so Luca's going to have to pick his spots. Time to head to Michael C. Williams. 
Tonight here at Bellator 296, the prelims go now to the welterweight division, set for three five-minute rounds. Introducing the blue corner at six foot, weighing in 169.6 pounds. His professional record near perfect at eight and one. By way of Moldova, he fights out of Dublin, Ireland, Luke O'Cleese. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot, weighing in 170 pounds even. His professional record, 11 victories, three losses out of Stockholm, Sweden, Oliver Enkamp. And in charge, your referee, Kevin McDonald. So a friend of mine who is a huge fan of MMA, huge fan of you, Big John, and of Josh as well. He said this is a real MMA geeks fight, this, this one. Is, oh, this is, <laughs> I've been looking forward to this because both guys are so good with certain aspects of the fight game here. And they're, they both have submissions that they can pull off that a lot of other guys can't. So I'm just looking to see who gets, who gets there first. Well, Pockley invented the Lucanator, that submission of uh, Dante Skiro. Fantastic. Both really talented. Completes uh, second time in the Bellator cage. End camp four and one. He produced that buggy choke win against Martin Leminger at Wembley when he was under pressure, but outstanding. He does win. often find a way, you know. But you got to look and see. And this is the difference right here. The wrestling of Poclete is better than Encamp's wrestling. Encamp stand-up is better than Poclete's, but their submission games are so close. It's like, who's going to be the guy that, that grabs hold and latches on and creates the situation first? It's almost the submission equivalent of who lands first. It's one of those, isn't it? I know it's not quite the same, but it's a... Sort of a way of explaining it. Nice reversal by end camp. Beautifully done. Gets himself to the top position now. We'll see what he does as far as going after strikes or if he's going to look at going for the submissions. But I'll tell you what, he did a great job of using that mission control position to get that reversal and get into the top position. Clean from shot. Camp, really clean shot. And Cam going right back to that. Mission control now. Great flexibility right now by end camp. Poclete having some problems with this. As going towards what we call the dead orchard here. You see those hands. Look at you see where Luca Poclete's hands are. That's bad. You, got, you can't have them down on the ground here. And right now they're kind of stuck based upon the leg placement of end camp. Oh, going for a go go. Looking for the go-go platter, isn't he here, Encamp? Can he get that leg up and around? You've seen the go-go before. <laughs> Encamp with some incredible flexibility there. He would be picking me up in two pieces right now. Nice job by Luca Pokli. Staying calm. And Cam is always learning. He's an MMA world traveler from a karate family. Loves trying out great jumps. Beautiful job. Look at him swing the leg. That's to help swing that, that reversal. See if he can get the sweep. He wasn't able to use it. Dave, I was just told so we know we could put out that the last fight with Sal Rogers against David Guyon was overturned and brought into a no contest. There was no loser, there was no winner. Well, that's good to hear. 
We will, I presume, see it. And presume nothing, of course. I think we'll see it again. I think we would. And that feels right for everybody. But you feel for everyone involved, but we move on, I guess. These things happen. And there is no question that nobody's perfect. Great job by NCAP in staying busy. That was landing clean shots. Now Pokleet's turn to try and attack the neck of NCAP. NCAP is a nightmare to fight, isn't he? Here he goes again. Yep. This is close to what he did with Leminger. An inverted triangle look to see if he can get that leg. He wants to try to slide it down. I don't think he has enough time to get it. In the closing seconds of the opening round, but great attacking here from Ancap. John, talk us through what we've seen so far. Man, there were so many things. This is when NCAP had reversed the position. He ends up getting on top, trying to land some good shots. Paul Cleek goes. Takes him right back to the position at the top, but then you saw it, and this is even later on. Here comes the inverted triangle looking for it. He tried to get the go-go plata, if you recall. A lot of submission attempts by Oliver Encamp. I think that was the difference in that round. Encamp has 11 wins in amongst those five different methods of submission. Pockley, eight wins, four for him. That just gives you a flavor of what they can both do. Well, one of the things that can happen off of the when you're when you're seeing someone like Encamp in all of those positions that he's getting stretched and the way he's using his legs, your legs do get tired. And we're going to see if that has any effect on him in the second round. How does he move? Are his legs getting a little bit heavy? Well, Encamp did say he might try and keep this on the feet because he believed he was stronger there. So don't be too surprised by this. It is going to be the case because if you're if you're Paul Cleet, you you got him to the ground fairly easily, but you also got put into some dangerous positions down there. Are you going to take it right back down to the ground and possibly put those again? And that spinning back fist win against Lewis Long in Dublin from Encamp showed really good technique on the feet. Got it in him. Right on cue, he spins. Decided against it. Jab there from Buckley. Yeah, nice cap switches to South Four and switches back. Oh, good. Left hand there from Pockley. Pockley getting a little square, though. Notice how he's kind of, there's no blade. It's getting pretty flat, which means you can be hit to attack to the both, both sides. And so might be the right thing for him to do. He's feeling comfortable with it, but. Looks a big target, though. Exactly. Look at pockets of success for Bocklead on the feet, but Encamp looks more comfortable. Nice 
Nice hook kick. Really good from Encamp, and now Bokley looks, and now Encamp attacks the neck. Yeah, but he does not have that neck right there. Try and keep the legs clear, Luca. Try and keep those 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 legs clear, Quite say it's got easier since, but uh, he's built up a good record. Training with his good friend Gunny Nelson uh, to help him with his preparation for this. Victor Tsiobanu's voice uh, barking out instructions for Luca Pocli. And Camp trying to change that angle, trying to get to a point where he can look for a submission, going for the triangle here. Pocli doing a nice job of at least squaring up his hips every time. You're seeing end camp trying to change that angle. You're seeing Pokli square those hips up, keep himself safe. Well, this second round might still be up for grabs here between these two in what is a close fight. Well, Encam was looking for that arm bar but never had control of the arm. That's what they wanted from uh, Pockley. Final second, though. Nice hook kick by Oliver Encamp right there. Just didn't quite get it landed solid, but did touch. Pocleet then goes for the takedown. And from that point, Pocleet was able to really control position. He did land some shots, not a lot. He didn't see any real submission attempts as far as that were anything that could have worked. He went for the arm bar. There was no arm there. Pocleet right now utilizing his wrestling to try to put end camp in positions where he can't use his stand-up and I think Pocleet feels that he's safe now with the submissions. Right, so the third and final round, Oliver Encamp and Luca Pocleet, how have you got this one, John, going into this final round? I have this even. I think both guys need to go after it in this round. I had Encamp winning the first, I have Pocleet winning the second. Who's fresher? between them at all here. You can see Paul Cleet looking to change levels right then. And you can see that he was just waiting for that moment that he could change levels to try to get to this takedown. Could be a crucial moment with Four minutes remaining, although Encab is working from the bottom. He is working from the bottom. If you notice now, he's been able to, we talk about changing that angle, turning the angle. He's on that angle right now. He's got the hips slid out. He's in a half guard. Luca trying to just crush down on him, trying to just control the position. 
And trying to do damage as well. Yep. Paul Cleet showing that he's got very good sense of base and balance. He understands where he needs to be, so end camp can't get those sweeps. What he's trying to do is not going to work. But it does limit the amount of offense that Paul Cleet can bring. Three minutes remain, and you have to feel that this is still open. It's still there for somebody, either, wow. of course, via submission. Like, let's just be honest, if it stays this way, yeah, Paul Cleet's going to win. But this fight is still anybody's at this point. All it's going to take is one mo one motion. That's the thing, even if it's not a submission, it's an attempt or it's pressure or it's sure. landing a couple of big shots. Feels that tight. Nice job by Encamp bringing that up. Got the ability to possibly lock in, going for the go-go. Nice job by Pokley to get rid of that. Right back to the triangle attempt. Pokley aware those legs are a constant danger, aren't they? Elastic legs from Encamp. Constant problem. He needs to be very careful where his arm's at. He's got himself in trouble there, there Pokley. does. Inverted triangle right now by Encamp. How tight does he have it here, Encamp? And he needs to look to control that left arm. He's unable to hold on. That left arm was big. Pokley doing a nice job of breaking through. Into the final 90 seconds of the fight. Still, it's there for someone. Still almost a good 30 seconds is going to win at you. It feels that way, John. Absolutely possible. Pokli getting in a nice position to be able to control the position, land with his right hand. And Cam can look towards a Kimura right now. Nope. And you see Paul Cleet, he's, he's aware of it, he sees it, feels it, pulls out. And he's dealt with it well there, but Cleet almost difficult. brushed it aside. Very difficult for what Encamp is looking for with that leg right now. He's got both hands engaged on that. Not an easy thing, but he could possibly try to climb up, take the back. That's what he's going for here, isn't it, Encamp? But he's only got 20 seconds left. Nice sweep. See if he's looking towards that knee bar. That's what he's going for late on here, but it wasn't there. Final five seconds. Well, how do you have it? How do you have it? What did you make of it? People at home, I know a lot of them like to score these fights, like to make up their own mind. I'm going to ask you the same question. You I'll let you take a swig of your drink first, but how did you have it? I go with the same thing that I looked at before. Pokleet was able to take Encamp down. And in taking him down, how many strikes did he land on the ground? Not many. Very few. How many submissions did he go after? Zero. Oliver Encamp was looking for submissions, looking to do things to end it. Now, I never thought he got that close to a real submission that Luca was in trouble with, but at least he was looking for him. Look, the fight could go either way. I could see, you know, Luca Pokley getting the win. I could see Oliver Encamp getting the win. I always go and lean towards the guy that I think is trying to actually finish the fight, not let the clock run out. And so I go with Oliver Encamp. I thought you rode the fence for quite a long time there, and then you came down. <laughs> <laughs> I knew where I was going. No, I knew. <laughs> yeah, I just, just didn't know how to get there. We figured it too. But of course, and of course, the longer it takes, the closer you know it is. It's the golden rule in scoring a combat sport. So no sign of Michael just yet, I don't think. 
He's standing at the scorer's table going, anytime. Anytime. It's one of those, isn't it? But I think we always knew or always felt at least that it might be, and I can now see Michael making his way uh, into the cage. So we will find out very, very shortly. Then we've got one more fight in our prelims, and then, of course, we can build towards that main card. What a night we're set for. What a night we've already had. But let's go and find out who has got this with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, your three judges at cage side. Your first, Eric Cologne, 30 to 27, while judges Ben Cartledge and uh, Brian Miner, both the same at 29 to 28, all have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Luca Pocleet. Pocleet then gets it by unanimous decision and moves to nine and one. He does win the fight. The MMA geeks were looking forward to. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed it. We've got a great main event, though, tonight. So before our final prelim, let's get back to Amanda and Josh to talk us through that. Dave, thank you so much. We are less than an hour away from our main card, starting at 10 Paris time. I can do time zones for Eastern. Josh, yes, let's talk about the main event. This is one of those, as fight fans, we're so excited for it to happen. We're going to be so sad when it's done, because it's going to be so good. Gegard Mousasi going up against Fabian Edwards. Gegard Mousasi, a six-time world champion. He's got a chip on his shoulder, because he lost his last fight. He lost his belt to Johnny Eblen. Whoever wins this gets to face Johnny Eblen. Blend. Fabian Edwards is a tough opponent, but Gegard Mousasi is just so good all the way around. Yeah, Gegard's never dropped two fights in a row in his whole career, and I think there's a lot at stake for him because he understands, look, I am getting older, and I understand what I need to get done. What he needs to do, though, to get back on the win track is to do what he's done his whole career, is be a well-rounded fighter. He is a dominant fighter from the top position. When he fought John Salter, he stuffed a bunch of takedowns. He made John Salter work for every takedown attempt. And when he got to the top position, he made him pay. He puts on the hurt when he gets to that top. But then when he fought Austin Vanderford, he understood that Vanderford couldn't stand with him. So all he had to do was stuff takedowns and let the hands go. He stuffed the takedown, got to the top position, and does work. Now, now the difference will be, though, is Fabian Edwards will not shoot tonight. But what I believe is that Gegard needs to utilize all of his weapons and his tools. He needs to utilize his takedowns. He has to utilize his ground and pound. But the way he has to do that is by getting to this top position against Fabian Edwards, not work too hard and make himself tired. Against Halado, uh, Rafael Lovato Jr., he did a great job of stuffing all the submissions, getting to the top, and that third round, had there been a little more time, he might have potentially finished Rafael Lovato Jr. Gegard Musasi, such a fun personality, such a fun guy to talk to, but I gotta tell you, he was definitely more serious in our talks this week. He says he has a renewed focus. Fabian Edwards, you will see his brother Leon Edwards in his corner tonight. Looks such an incredible fighter, but he's a little wild sometimes. He said that he, he fights to the level of his opponent, which isn't always necessarily a good thing. Uh, it is a good thing when it comes to Gegard Musasi, but he needs to go in there with a little bit of fire, you said. Yeah, see, Gegard Mousasi has always been one of the best, I think, fighters in the world, especially at middleweight. But Fabian Edwards, if he's going to fight to that level, at least he knows he's going to have to raise his level to get past Gegard Mousasi. And I believe as long as he doesn't let Gegard settle in and start to dictate the pace of the fight, he didn't he didn't let uh, Lyoto Machida do that, and he was able to get capitalized on big shots. He got away from the brakes and really pushed the, pushed the tempo on this. And I called this fight against Falcon Neto, and what he did was he, got, he lost the takedown off of a kick. But he didn't settle on the bottom. He hit the up kicks. He got back up to his feet and finished the fight. He can never afford to let Gegar Mousasi get going. He needs to control the tempo of the fight and never settle in. It is his dream for him and his brother to be champions at the same time. But, of course, Gegar Mousasi wants his belt back. They're just one fight away from that chance. Dave, that's our main event. We'll send it back down to you for our final prelim. Thank you so much, Amanda, and you know it's a great car. When you hear the guys just talking about the fight, you think, wow, I cannot wait. But time now for our final prelim. Two fighters have sparred. Now do it for real. Paula Cristina of Rio de Janeiro, of course, in Brazil, takes on Denise Kielholz, who's freshened up her training camp and who needs a big performance here. Now set to make her way to the cage, Paula. Beating Kosh. Well, the worst.
were some rumours yesterday, turned out to be false rumours, that Paola Cristina Bittencourt was struggling to make way, but big false alarm, she made it just fine in the end. It's a Bellator debut for her, an opportunity really to take on a big-name opponent who she'll believe that she can upset. She's looked determined, you know, to enjoy every single second of the fight week experience, and it looks like that attitude has continued in tonight. But can she turn in the kind of display that she will need here against yet a wounded opponent, but still one who fights at a very, very good level. And now, ready to make her way to the cage, Denise, Miss Dynamite. Well, Denise Kielholtz needs a win, any kind of win, after three consecutive defeats. And what must be can only be a draining of confidence. She's made a change in her team. She's gone with a fresh look. She says that she feels energized and motivated. And she sparred Paola Cristina Bittencourt and believes that a Brazilian is made to measure her. A chance then for all of the confidence to come flooding back. And by the way, may I say a very warm welcome to Videoland from the Netherlands, our latest broadcast partner here with Bellator. They, of course, will be fascinated by this. Well, the tail of the tape for the flyweights, Denise Kielholz and Paola Christina Bittencourt. And John, you wanted to look at that age difference. Is time ticking for Denise Kielholz? Well, that's the real question here at 34 years of age. We see Denise Kielholz actually fight for the title. Does she still have that fire burning in her? We're going to find out tonight. Yeah, let's find out. Let's head to Michael C. Williams. Tonight, we welcome Video Land to the Bellator family, and we thank you for bringing the live action to the fans in the Netherlands as we are set now here in Paris to conclude our prelims. We'll go three five-minute rounds in the flyweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at five foot three, weighing in 126 pounds even in her Bellator debut. She enters with six wins, just one loss from Ana in the North Brazil, presenting Paulo Beating Court. And across the cage, her adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot three, weighing in 125.2 pounds, a kickboxing world champion and flyweight title challenger. She stands as a professional at six and five, ranked at number six. She fights out of Amsterdam, Netherlands, presenting the knees, Miss Dynamo. And in charge, your referee, Kevin McDonald. So Denise Kielholz does not have a special head coach now. She's been training a lot with the wrestling team at the Coliseum Gym. She's moved from Bob Schreiber. She says she's been missing that source, as she describes it, but now she's found it again. So watch this space well. We'll see. She's talked of taking more risks, of needing to, to make things happen. Well, we all know that Denise in the stand-up, and she is explosive. That's why she's called Miss Dynamite. Very fast, has good power, good kicks, good punches, good knees, all of it. She's also good on the ground, but at times, it's almost like she falls asleep down there, and she'll make a mistake and allow someone to lock in a submission. The real question is, does she start to take control of this fight from the beginning? Right now, you're seeing, Christ, you know, Paula Christina coming forward, but it's a matter of who's the effective aggressor. Many times, we'll talk about a fighter that can, you know, most fighters can't go backwards and fight well. Denise Kielholz can. Well, it was interesting. Denise Kielholz said that Paula Christina does come forward, does come to fight, and. That is what makes her perfect for me, because I can walk her onto shots. As I said, they have sparred together in Brazil. Denise said she got the better of that. She's having a look here, but she's looking uh, more confident, but she always does on her feet. 
You got to figure Denise went five rounds with Juliana Velasquez when she was the champion. She, she lost that by one round. And she can be on the feet with anyone. She was a world champion in kickboxing many times. She is still outstanding on her feet. It's a matter of she needs to be well-rounded and smart throughout the fight. Use the feet well. Well, defeat was the UAE. United Arab Emirates in March of last year. That was a good left hook from Kielholtz. Yeah, she got that one back. <laughs> Anything you can do. <laughs> great use of those kicks as well from Kielholtz. And it's one of the th advantages that Denise has. She can switch from southpaw to orthodox. It does not matter. She's effective at both stances. She throws a beautiful jab with her right hand or left hand. If you can do that, you can do it purely. You can truly change angles, can't you? And give someone a nightmare in terms of looks at things. Jab is such an underutilized weapon by a lot of fighters in MMA, and it can be so effective. It gets there fast. It has, if you have snap on that thing, it will have a big effect on the fight. I'd say there's a very large percentage of retired boxers who sit there wistfully and say, I wish I'd known from the start the jab was the most important punch. <laughs> Definitely he's not the flashiest, but man, effective-wise, can do so much. Money in the bank. Good start here from Miss Dynamite, Denise Kielholtz. footwork as well from her to earn the right to land these shots and it's the real difference Paul Christina is doing a good job of trying to cut off that cage which is not easy to do it's, you know it's not there's no corner there but she's getting a little flat-footed and every time she gets flat-footed you'll you'll see Denise cut an angle and throw a shot See? Jab to head, jab to body, nice mixing of levels there. <laughs> Missed by much with that, Paola Cristina. No, Denise did not miss with that, she landed that left. <laughs> Just landed it again. That left hand's becoming effective. Losing seconds of the opening round and a right hand there, a good sharp one for Denise Keelholtz to finish things off. Some of the action you see, Paula Christina was really trying to land counter. She was trying to counter everything that Denise was doing. She just couldn't get that range down. Paula lands his left hand clean. That was well done. Denise misses hers. But overall, when you're taking a look at all the shots that were thrown, more landed more cleanly by Denise Kielholtz in that round.
Louise Keelholtz has talked of having uh, what she calls an ABCD plan, not just an A. Trying to work on that all-round game. There's that left hand you were talking about. That's it. Action back start to the second round here. I love when Denise lets her hands go and she goes after it. She's got fast hands. Paula Christina is putting a lot of pressure trying to come forward, trying to look for the counters. Every time she sees Denise stepping in, you see her looking for that counter. Having little pockets of success with it, but. Not enough to really convince. Oh. He says no problem. with their little check hook on that. Definitely feels like a, a brighter, lighter on her feet, Denise Keelholtz. Looks happier in there, actually. She's smiling <laughs> and enjoying it. Of course, she would be, because she's on her feet, and opponent suits her, but it's good to see. Sure our Dutch colleagues will be enjoying this performance so far. So that marking under the, the right eye of uh, Paola Cristina. Cristina's got a really good jab. You know, when she brings it out, it's fast. She just needs to go to it more. Nice left hand again by Kielholtz. See a bit more of that. Love to see a jab to the body or two as well. Good court. Always trying to come forward, always looking for foot pressure, but she's got to throw her hands more. Right hand from uh, Christina Bitten Court, but paid the price a bit for that one. I think that's why she's a bit wary of letting her hands go. She knows what might come back. That's exactly it. Takedown attempt by Christina, but well defended by Denise Kielholz. But if a fight's settling into a pattern that's not going to go your way, you have to try and change, change something. It up. Exactly right. Maybe she'll try throwing her hands and taking the risk that comes with that. keep bursting out but for long periods they're trying to counter each other yep and if there, if there was one thing i'd want to see out of denise a little more she's throwing the one two don't forget that three four those are the ones that are normally going to land good right hand that landed right there but that was three <laughs>
little check left hook and landed for Christina there. Well placed. Left hook coming back from Keel Holtz. Really the difference is the range. Denise is feeling a little bit more comfortable with the range and able to cover the distance a little bit better. That's why you're seeing the counters working for her and not quite working the same for Christina. All but one of Denise Kielholtz's 11 professional MMA fights have been in the Bellator cage. She wants to be relevant. At the moment, she looks to be safely on the winning track here. So Paolo Christina Bittencourt does have power. She's got Four wins by knockout. If she does step in, take a risk, maybe try and land something. There is still something there for her. <laughs> Left hand there from uh, Denise Kielholtz. It is always fascinating to watch. You've already mentioned it, John, but the, the way that Keelholtz switches so effortlessly. Not many fighters can do that and almost look as comfortable either way, but she does. She does. And the, and the big difference you're seeing, you're, you're seeing about a five to one output difference here. And if, if you're that person like Christina is, that you're on that short end, that means that you've got to be landing with shots that are powerful and doing damage, and she hasn't really been able to do that either. The other thing that's impressive, just going back to that switching, is that she doesn't get caught square when she does it. She maintains that position and that shape, but really good. One of those things I always think, it's a lot harder. You talk to fighters, it's a lot harder to do than she's making it look. Well, and it's one of the things, you know, everything starts from the base. It's your foundation, and her footwork is really good, and that's what makes Denise difficult to fight. She moves in and out well. She has balance all the time. And when you have someone that's been taught the right way like that, then they become a very good and talented fighter, which she is. That was a nice right hand landed by Christina right there. And now, Denise, you, back to that left hand. Use those feet to get into range and land that four times now in the last 30 seconds. But again, it's just not enough volume, not enough output from Paula Cristina. She's waiting too much. She's got to go after you. There comes that point, you just got to say, I just got to go. I got to throw. And she's just not throwing enough. Denise continues to just pick her apart, throwing a lot of volume out there, not worrying about throwing the knockout kick. I'm just going to keep on putting shots on her and just let them add up. Corners just told her you've got two minutes. You've got to put it on her. for the final minute here between Paolo Cristina and Denise Kielholtz. <laughs> this might feel like an opportunity lost for Paolo Cristina, at least to show us what she's got. <laughs> 
easier said than done, maybe, when you've got someone like Kiel Holtz in front of you. Big right hand. Christina trying to come back and react off of it. It's just that right now, she just doesn't have the ability to, to stay in the stand-up with Denise. Denise going up and down now, going to the body. Beautiful jab. And now she's just opening up and letting loose of it. Now she wants to fight Denise Keelholz. Look at this. See it again. There's the jab and a big right hand from it. Look at all those shots missing by Christina. Grandstand finish here from Keelholz. Closing seconds. Miss Dynamite's back. Great respect between them. Of course, as I said, they've sparred. They know how good each other are. And yeah, there's a nice touch of friendship at the end, but that's a good outing, that John, for Denise Keelholtz. Very nice outing. She really performed well. Good volume attacks. She tried to go after power shots at times. Really a big difference. I don't know what the output difference was, but I would honestly say it's five to one at least. Felt that way, didn't it? Yeah. Definitely felt that way. Well, there's the Keelholz team. They'll be uh, delighted with large parts of that, John. And you can take a look. Look at those shots that are landing. She landed with power at times, a lot of volume. Hits the right, left. Christina coming back all the time, but especially once she decided to really open up. Beautiful straight right hand. Comes back. There's that one, two, three. That's what we're looking for. Throw the three, throw the four. Well, we're building nicely now towards our dazzling main card here in Paris. We've watched a great set of prelims here, this capacity crowd, and we're about to round things off because I can see Michael C. Williams making his way into the cage to deliver the uh, final verdict of these prelims. Just line the fighters up, and then we will uh, head to Michael C. Williams for the decision. Ladies and gentlemen, in tonight's final prelim, we go again to your judges' scorecards, where your first judge, Sal D'Amato, scores it 29 to 28, with judges Brian Miner and Chris Lee both seeing it the same at 30 to 27. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Denise Miss Dynamo. Good to see her smiling. Good to see her back. Wonder where she'll go next, but that is a different story for a different day. It's great to have Denise Keelholz back in a winning habit. So the main card is coming our way. It gets underway with Thibaut Guti and Kane Musa, Douglas Lima, Costello Van Steenis. Just look at these, what fights they are. Brent Primus and Mansour Barnawi and Gegard Mousasi and Fabian Edwards. Do not miss it. We will be back at the top of the hour and we'll see you then. Ready for battle, I'm ready to fight. This is my legacy, this is my right. The Bellator Cage has landed. Sassi versus Edwards today on Chota.
instead of a marking or a cut on scope. Nicely done. Beautiful right hand by Omer. He just changed levels just slightly, John, and came over the top. Yeah, he's, he's very good with his stand-up game. Brings his hands in different positions and normally takes his head off that center line. So when he comes in, you think you've got that range and you know where you're going to go. His head's just a little bit off and it slips by. Nicely done. Great work in the clinch. He is doing big work with that right hand, Mike. That right hand is finding a mark. Oh, oh he's in trouble. Body shot. He's, he's in deep trouble here, Mike. It's going to be the end and he doesn't move. Oh, nice. And right back to the, the body. body. And it is all over. Ellen Omar with another finish. His 15th first round finish. I told you that Omar is now in that zone, man. He has got it going on. He understands exactly what he needs to do in a fight. And both in the stand-up, and then when he gets to the ground, he is a completely different fighter. He's able to control the fight. He's able to do big damage just like he just did. When we talked to Bernal earlier in the week, we asked him about Martin the Hitman Campbell was the first star for Denmark in the sport of MMA. Bernal says, I'm carrying the torch right now. And he's still the best. Double, he's got hooks inside. Right now, landing big shots to the sides of Darko's head. Darko's got to figure out, I got to start to move. Cannot get his hips taken out from him, which is what's happening. You see his leg up in the air. That means he's dead in the water. There's nowhere for him to go. He's in trouble. Move. He's trying to move, he's burning a lot of energy, but he's just taking shots and they're not gonna let this in. It is all over, just like that. Max Burnell, impressive performance. Again, look at the shots in the side head, and you see Banovich doing nothing. And that's exactly why you saw the fight coming to an end. It's really interesting watching Galon, because as a person, he's constantly active, but he's like that in the cage as well. Those knees to the body there, he's always making something happen. Here's a crucifix position, the soft kick, step over that arm, now he's got free reign with his right hand, elbow also, to just out on Brander, and it's only a matter of time that Brander cannot get himself out of here. Eventually, the referee, Jacob Montalvo, will stop it, depending upon, especially with the elbows. Yeah, the punches are one thing, the elbow there was heavy, and again, cut above that right eye of Brander, referee's having a close look. If Galon lands again here, I think it's over. There's another elbow. All this real strong. Notice the position. Finally got the arm. Now he put the arm back. I thought he was actually going to go for an Americana with it. He just put it back in place and went right back to this massive ground of power. And he keeps coming. He keeps coming. country one of the stars of the cage he seems to have everything likable excitable and he's better and better inside that cage likable excitable and destructive <laughs> I mean that was just a, a clinic on once you hit the ground how to just put your opponent in bad positions and start putting big shots on him that was a beautiful attack by David Gallo It's interesting to hear Shipman talk about his life and his career and how the hiatus in the pandemic made him rethink stuff, made him reset things, and just determined to enjoy every single second in there. This is my night. Big shot right there, another big shot. The left hand jackhammered him twice. These are really dangerous moments for Stewart. Desperately trying to get back to his feet. Trying to fight his
his way out of trouble. It was a nice job by Kyle Stewart to fight his way out of there. He was in a bad spot. He took some big, heavy shots to the body with the knees. Those do not feel good. He was able to withstand them. The problem is the damage is going to start to accumulate. It's going to start to slow him down, which is only going to make him slower in the fight. Lorenz is not going to get slower. Been a dominant opening round, this from Larkin. Getting the body that hurt. You can see how he, his body not good for him right now. He's in trouble. Stewart's in massive trouble. from Lorenz Larkin. It's all of his skill distilled into one round. It's the speed and it's the power and it's the shot selection and it's the brilliance. He might be unranked. He might feel he's underrated, but that was outstanding. This is what a thinking fighter does. Watch how Lorenz picks his spots. He's not just going crazy. He's actually picking out everything that he wants to do. Gets the knee to the body. He sees his opponent turn, goes, okay, I can't use that attack. Let me do something different. Everything he's doing is beautifully done by a smart fighter that understands how to attack his opponent. that left hand again he hasn't been able to miss with that all night long been taken apart bit by bit and oh. Two shots, the left hand puts him down. And this is what I'm talking about, when he wants to. He can do this at any time. He just decides not to, I'll just stay out here and just do it. Look at that right hand. I mean, that is just a bomb. You see referee Mike Beltran stopping the fight right there. Watch the one, two. Down goes Polizzi. That is just massive. And I can't believe Alex Polizzi actually is able to be on his feet with that. Champion Caballo in the red gloves, the challenger Musasi in the blue gloves. Musasi told us that Caballo's height and length was the only two things that really gave him pause. Well, in talking with him, the one thing he said is, look at, I know he's dangerous, I know he's long, I know he's powerful, but I know how to fight him. And that was the confidence that he brought into this. So we're gonna see, does he know how to fight this guy? London crowd chanting Musasi. Gegard Musasi has fought all over the world for almost, well, I believe he's fought for every major promotion that has existed in mixed martial arts. Think about it, Moro. Strike Force champion, dream middleweight and light heavyweight champion. Two he and one in pride. And now Musasi explodes for the takedown. And Caballo will try to get back up to his feet as quick as possible because you do not want to mess with Musasi on the ground. No, this is a big, important moment right now. Does Caballo get back to his feet? Good. Caballo gets back to his feet. That's very impressive, but he still has Gegard on his back, and he's going to bring him right back down. And Caballo, remember, in his professional debut, suffered a anaconda choke submission, but he's reeled off 15 consecutive victories since, and Caballo now looking for a standing Kimura, but he's taken down. Musasi. Beautiful outside trip and how he did that. That was beautiful, Moral. That was an impressive takedown by Gegard. First of a possible five five-minute rounds for the Bellator MMA middleweight championship. Go behind by Musasi with the waist lock. He'll try to drag Caballo back to the ground. Gets on top. Caballo. Just past the midpoint of the opening round. 
Bayo controlling, was well, attempting to control Musasi's posture. Musasi into full mount. Dire straits for the Bellator MMA middleweight champion. Bayo just wanting to stay as close to Musasi as he can. Neck crack attempt here and Musasi feeding Bayo right hands. He saw the lace with the left hand. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end officially. Three minutes, 35 seconds into round number one. The winner by TKO, and now the new Bellator middleweight world champion, Gagard Musasi. Two champions in their prime. It really doesn't get Ready much fight. better Ready. than Good. this. The bell, and round one, McDonald in the blue gloves, Musasi in the red gloves. What do you look forward to early on in this fight, John? I look for Rory McDonald to try to establish that jab. He's got to establish the jab to get the respect of Gegard Musasi to stand up. Well, Musasi possesses one of the best jabs in the sport. He does. But if you're looking at Rory McDonald, you have to say you've got to start establishing the ability to get that takedown. Like oh. And now McDonald's attempting the takedown, but it's Musasi delivering elbows, and now Musasi inside the guard of Rory McDonald. He's trying to work things out. You see him opening that guard, but going back for a close, but he's trying to change the angle. He's having a hard time controlling the posture of Gago. Musasi's been submitted three times in his career, but it's all about the ground and pound. Now a wide base, and there is McDonald controlling or keeping Musasi. Look at that slice through, right yep. there, right into half guard. Beautiful slice by Gigard Musasi, and he's actually trying to go oh, right to full mount. Musasi has mounted Rory McDonald here in round two, and McDonald trying to hold on. See him taking his hips, bringing him up high on to Rory McDonald's chest. This is a bad position wow. for Rory. Rory was mounted by Damian Maya. But Damian Meyer doesn't have the strikes that Gengar Musasi has. Wow, Red King. Is in trouble. And Musasi treating the Red King. 